You're listening to the Joelle Martin Mastery Podcast, home of the two-hour deep dive interview with gold, platinum, and multi-platinum bands, including Stained, Blue Rodeo, The Arkells, Finger Eleven, Big Wreck, Moist, Bedouin Soundclash, I Mother Earth, Hill Scarlet, Neverending White Lights, Thornley, and many more. Please take a moment to subscribe to the podcast as well as share, comment, and like. Now let's dive in to today's episode. Welcome, everyone, to today's episode of the podcast. Thank you for joining us. We really appreciate it. We are joined by a very special guest. He's achieved a level of mastery as the drummer for the Juno Award-winning and three-time Grammy-nominated band Crash Test Dummies, who have sold over 10 million albums. So welcome to the podcast, Mitch Dorge. Mitch, how are you? And is it true that you have exquisite taste in shoes with a collection to match? Well, first of all, how am I? I am fine. I am 100%. Uh, the weather here in Winnipeg is outstanding. I had a little bit of rain yesterday, but uh, here we are in September and I could be out cutting the grass and sitting on my deck having a nice beverage. The shoes. Well, yeah, uh, yes, it is true. The shoes we have to blame my wife for. Uh, we were taking a holiday in Italy and uh, we went to San Giamani and we were walking along the, the corridor and I looked into a shoe store and there was this pair of shoes that were blue and brown. Quite frankly, they looked like bowling shoes. I looked at them and I said, wow, those shoes have my name on them. So this was 10 o'clock in the morning and she said, let's try them on. I said, sweetheart, it's 10 o'clock in the morning. I don't, if I like these shoes, I'm going to have to carry them around all day. I just, let's just keep going. She said, no, we should go in and try on those shoes. So into the store we go. I try on the shoes. They fit like slippers. Uh, you know, I don't know how much bowling you've done, but when you go bowling and you put on those bowling shoes, sometimes they're pretty darn comfortable. These were exquisitely comfortable, unbelievable, exceptional, I might use. And she said, well, what about those ones over there? Those red ones. And uh, I said, well, let's go try those on. So while I was trying those on, she was purchasing the other ones. And here we are at uh, 1030 in the morning in San Giamani, Italy. And I've got these shoes that she bought for me. And I wore them on a show. And someone, a fan, made a comment about the shoes, the drummer's shoes. So I, I said, hey, someone's recognized the shoes. Isn't that cool? Well, Christmas time came along and lo and behold, another pair of shoes show up in the mail. So she went to the people that made those shoes, had another pair, pair made. These were blue, green and white. And uh, now, I've, now I've got two shoes. And just with two pairs of shoes, fans are noticing the drummer's shoes. How that happens, I don't know. So uh, before you know it, now we're in New York and I'm walking by a shop and I see there's a, a pair of like really cool shoes that really kind of look like um uh like they came out of breaking bad. You know, the the that's the, like the best show of all time. Yeah. Two brothers, you know, the two brothers that go go out and taking everybody out. The Mexican well, they, guys, yeah, yeah, yeah. They they look like that. And and I said, oh, I gotta have those shoes. Well, this trend continued on and before you know it i've got a suitcase that travels just it just stays with all the gear and uh there's there's uh, currently right now there's 19 pairs of shoes in there and i try to I, every, every show that we go to i i try to make a conscious selection of the shoes i'm going to be wearing for that show and it, it, it's been happened quite often where I will be playing somewhere and I'll be saying, you know, tonight we're, we're in Cincinnati. And then someone will say, oh, are you wearing the red and black shoes tonight? Yeah, I am. And so I'll go and I'll dig out the black and white ones or the black and red ones. And, and away we go. So the shoes right now, they're kind of at a standstill because if you're not careful, you, they, they just kind of keep piling up and eventually they get squished and everything else. So the, the shoes are very unique, all of them. Uh, they all they all tell their own little story, and I, I just I, I really kind of dig uh, going out there and and having people notice like the drummer's footwear. It's, it seems ridiculous, but it happens. As a drummer, anything to get noticed is is a is a bonus, right? <laughs> you know what I I have it's it's a double edged sword because we play and I I have a, a, a plexiglass in front of me, and the, the That's plexi for the sound right. Yeah, plexi's for the sound. Uh, a lot of times people ask, why is it there? And especially 
uh, coming out of the pandemic, everybody was thinking that maybe that there was, uh, take one step back. A lot of people don't understand drums or they don't understand sound. They just like the music, which is the best way to go. And so when they see something like that, they're perplexed by it and, and they need to know. So the biggest thing that comes up is, well, why is it there? And it's there because I have really loud cymbals I, and, I, and they really cut. And when you have cymbals on a stage that are roughly about microphone height, the microphones, like all the front house microphones, like Brad's and Ellen's, they, the, those cymbals cut right into there. And so front of house is hearing the cymbals out front. So if he wants to get more vocal, uh, he gets more vocal, but he's also turning the cymbals up at the same time. Mm-hmm. So by putting the plexiglass in front, it cuts off the leakage and gives him way more control over the sound of the drums. However, the downside to that is that all the light which comes to the stage quite often just reflects off of that. And you'll see pictures of the band. If you you can go to my Facebook page, you can find pictures of the band. And, and it just looks like there's this white cage <laughs> with nobody behind it. Periodically, the light will hit it the right way. So if their light's coming from behind, then you can see that there's somebody there. And, and with the, if there's light overhead, then you can see that it's me. So the, the first of all, you might not be able to see me at all, period, let alone the shoes. And uh, we actually had one venue where there was a screen behind us. And the screen behind us was reflecting off the, the uh, plexi in front of me. I saw nothing the entire show. All I saw was the reflection of the screen behind me. <laughs> it was ridiculous. So, uh, yeah, you know, if I'm wearing the shoes and I get noticed, that's kind of a bonus. But I, I, I just, I just, I think it's cool that I can bring something to the stage other than just, you know, flashy shirts or or uh, big hair and twirling sticks. Let's be honest. The plexiglass is there to isolate and protect the shoes from from anything yeah. any harm that could come the way of the shoes i so i was looking through your instagram and i was able to see some delicious shoes that were white black red gold blue green and brown am i missing any from your amazing collection uh there's gray there is uh uh so the white ones are new uh, are the couple- white ones that have kind of the t- the crocodile looking yeah. tile yeah. yeah oh those looked amazing yeah and there's a couple others that look like they came from like 1873 uh tapestry uh and and those un- unfortunately not all of them are great shoes to play drums in uh, i would say half the shoes that i have are really comfortable to play drums in the other half like the, especially the ones that are let, let's call them the, the breaking bad shoes uh they are a little bit elongated and they tend to get in the way a little bit and i have to i have to really be conscious that i not to get into habitual playing i really got to focus on and make sure that my foot's in the right place and and uh usually by mid-show I, i'm locked in and I'm, I'm not thinking about it but the the first thing that happens is i sit down and i go oh, wait a minute this this pedal feels weird and then i look down and of course the shoes poking into the drum uh which you can't see because of the shelter of the security system of the plexiglass, which is keeping the shoes safe from people throwing stuff at them. Yeah, you don't want any tomatoes anywhere near those shoes. I I have some kind words sent in here from someone that can vouch for your shoe collection. So I like to start the interviews off by sharing with our listeners how the guests and I know each other, just showing the importance of networking, of building community, of fostering relationships. So in our case, I had uh, Dan Todd, the drummer for Platinum Blonde and Honeymoon Suite. I had him on as a guest. And when the interview is done, I always ask the guest, hey, can you think of anyone that would make for an amazing interview in the future? And he said, Mitch George. And here we are today. And to kick this off powerfully, I reached out to Dan to help me. And here's what Dan had to say. He wrote quite a bit, so he must like you. So here we go. Dan says, I saw Mitch with the crash test dummies for the first time when I was in grade 12. What an incredible drummer. The finesse, the chops. Mitch showed he had that aggressive punch, but could could also pull away back to an amazing touch. 25 years later, I reached out to Mitch when I was on tour with Platinum Blonde, and I offered to put him on the guest list for the show in his town. The place was packed, and I looked out into the theater, and I saw him. I was thrilled. Mitch came backstage after the show, and we were hanging, talking shop. I've got a bud for life. Mitch and I 
have a love for shoes, but nothing can compete with his collection. We once were chatting about his shoes and he asked my size. He then sent me a pair of the coolest red snake skin shoes that I absolutely love. My wife, Natalie, and I have connected with Mitch over the years, and we love being in his company. He is positive. He is motivating. He is the absolute salt of the earth. And don't get me started on the great Mitch Dorge hugs. Love you, brother. That's from Dan Todd, Platinum Blonde Honeymoon Suite. Well, I'm, 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 uh, I'm radiating right now. Now, what, what, what a kind thing to say. And you know what? Coming from a kind man. Uh, Todd's a wonderful, wonderful human being. I, never have I met anybody so non-invasive and polite. Uh, always, if I happen to be playing close to him or if I'm going to be in town, always drops a note saying, hey, if you got time, love to see you. But I, I understand the road life. If you haven't got time, I get it. And uh, I always try to make an effort to get together and quite a good hugger himself. Uh, Natalie, oof, well, it's hard to beat Natalie. Probably a better hugger, yeah. A better hugger, better hugger, yeah. Ah, uh, you know what? I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go full course on this one. Both of them administer a, a, a wonderful hug, and I'm, I'm the hugger that hugs eight seconds or eight minutes too long, uh, and, and he's good with that, which is, which is fantastic. You know, it's too long when the person has that slow like pat that they start on the back, like, okay, yeah, all right. I call that the burping. When you someone's when someone's bur- when someone starts burping me, I hang on a little tighter. Yeah, yeah. Right? You, gotta- you gotta let go. You gotta let go. Absorb the energy, and then once the energy is absorbed, then all right, okay, now we can move on. That's awesome. So when we were scheduling a date for this interview, I was saying, "Oh, how's Wednesday, September 6th? And you go, "Yeah, the date just works because on Saturday." you're going to see Peter Gabriel and you say, Oh, I'm going to see Peter Gabriel in Ottawa, which is where I am. And I'm also going to Peter Gabriel in Ottawa uh, because it's my dad's birthday and we got him tickets. He still doesn't know. And, um, I, so I'll be seeing you in person on Saturday at the Peter Gabriel concert. And my question is how does someone, uh, from Winnipeg end up at an Ottawa concert? Can you, can you tell me this? Well, I knew Peter Gabriel was going on tour. I've been a Peter Gabriel fan for for a very, very, very long time, even uh, back in Genesis. And um, I, I I was trying to pick a place that I could go that the show would be, I think, um, that the venue would do justice to the show. And my, my first choice was to go to London. Uh, the OG's playing the O2 in London. And uh, and then I thought, well, geez, you know what? Maybe Prague would be an, an interesting place to, to go uh, because I also use this opportunity to to just be someplace with my wife, just the two of us, where we're not dealing with bands and and children and animals and all those kinds of things. So uh, it just by pure fluke, a friend of mine who lives in Ottawa uh, called me up and said, "Hey, uh, you know, if you're ever thinking of coming by, we'd love it if you stayed at our place. It'd be it'd be fantastic." So I thought, hmm, Ottawa? I don't know. So I went and looked at the tour schedule. There he was. I said, got to make it happen. So called him up. And wouldn't you know it, he's also going to the show. We didn't know that he was going to the show. But he's also going to the show. And uh, so it's, it's going to make a, a great evening. Now, of course, you're going to the show. And I've, can it get better? I don't know. Yeah, my so my dad will be excited. He doesn't know that he's going yet, but he also loves the crash says dummies. So this is like a double whammy if he gets to say hi to you as well, which is pretty cool. Um, Yeah, there was no, uh, there was Ottawa dates for Peter Gabriel, Toronto, Montreal, but uh, it looked like they're going all the way to Vancouver, but no, no Winnipeg. Is that correct? No, I think, I think, yeah, I think Toronto and the next one's Vancouver. So, uh, and I, I've been to Vancouver enough, uh, seen enough shows in Vancouver and it, it generally those kinds of things that are, that are really special. I don't know how many more tours Peter Gabriel is going to do. And so I, I, if I can make it special by going like generally someplace far so that we get a taste of culture while we're out there, would it would have been fantastic. But as it turns out, I think being in Ottawa at this time of year should be fantastic. Are the trees turning yet in, in Ottawa? Uh, it's still pretty hot out here. Like, okay. 
Yeah, it's pretty summer ish out here. Okay, so the trees are just starting to turn here. Like they're we're getting some yellow, but I've been to Ottawa in the fall and like wow, it, Ottawa in the fall is amazing. Absolutely, yeah. You'll have to go to the uh, Byward Market and and walk around. It's uh, that'll they, be happening. Although they're forecasting rain uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, I think. How dare but they? Probably changing, but we'll see how it goes. We'll see if the weather gods smile upon us this weekend. Maybe, maybe yeah. that'll. They don't know like the day of what's going to happen. So, uh, a few days out, we we might be okay. Uh, so we're we're going to do a full two hour deep dive. We're going to cover your entire life, career, discography. Uh, but we have a, a a lot to get to to work our way up to the crash test dummies, to your solo album, to your speaking, to all the other stuff that you're up to. So let's go all the way back to the beginning. Where did this love of music come from? Do you have an earliest musical memory when you think back to your childhood? That would be that would be a lovely little story if if I did. Uh, I was that kid at the at the ripe old age of six because um, that's what I remember. I was that kid that when you went to a restaurant or or um, any public place and you heard two tables over some kid with a fork and a knife and a spoon hitting plates and glasses. And, and I, I used to, you know, I, I discovered that if you put water in a glass and less water in another glass, that the tone changed and all that kind of stuff. And, and you heard my mother saying my name a lot, like, Mitch, stop that. Mitch, stop, just Mitch. And then you, you, you hear the frustration. Uh, that was me. And, and I, and I just, I loved, uh, percussion. I loved making sounds. I loved to the tonality of, of things, the ways that different things sounded, loved using my hands. I was that kid in the backseat of the car, uh, you know, playing on the headrest, anything that made a noise that I could be percussive with. I was just that kid. And, uh, up until about, I think it was about nine or 10 years old, when when it was actually it was I was six and a half when my father had the conversation with me going you know your sister's taking piano lessons we think you should take play an instrument you know what instrument would you like to play I, I thought it was pretty obvious but I think he was thinking in terms of like maybe the saxophone or the guitar or the piano like my sister did and and well no I want to play drums so we we had this deal that he was going to rent me drums and, and I had to take music lessons. If I didn't take lessons, then I couldn't have the drums. So yeah. Okay. Let's do that. And like most drummer stories, I think that you've probably heard uh, a lot of my youth was mama, dada, mama, dada, mama, dada, playing single stroke roles. And I had the, the exercise books and everything else, but I had a cousin that came over one day and he played the intro for Hawaii Five-0. Now, I don't know if you remember the original Hawaii Five O, but there was this a, a drum fill. It's just it, it was just bugga 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 about da 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 da, and he played this thing, and I I was wow, I, I was so taken by by the, the way that it sounded and the way that it felt. So all of a sudden now I was going to my drum teacher and I say I want I want to learn how to play the thing for Hawaii Five O, and and my teacher was very much by the book. No, this is how we're gonna. This is the process of learning. So I, I, I said, I, I don't want to do this. And so the drums disappeared, right? I didn't want to take lessons. And that was the deal with my dad. So we negotiated, we got a new teacher. And again, I don't know that I would use the term love of music as much as I would use uh, the love of rhythm. That was probably more what was driving me at that point in time. Uh, got a new teacher. This new teacher came in and sat down and said, we're, we're going to, okay, here's our exercise book. And I was like, no, not again. Let's try another teacher. So we tried another teacher and this guy came in and said, so what do you want to play? And I, I was dumbfounded. What do you, what do you mean? What do I want to play? And I said, I want to learn how to play that thing from Hawaii Five-0. So he said, all right, well, let's, let's take it. Let's dissect it. Let's learn how to play it. <sighs> Are you kidding me? It's like, there, here it is. I found my teaching God. So we started playing. He would come in and he would say, you know, he had, we, had, we had a vinyl record player and he would say, okay, you know, bring in your favorite record and we're, we're going to play with whatever it is you want to play. So uh, I had a, a buddy that played accordion and uh, he showed up at my place. And of course, drums are so much louder than 
accordions, he would sit next to me with the bellows like right here. And he couldn't really play accordion, but it didn't matter. And he would just kind of go, rah, 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 just, it was just making noise. And I was like, rah, rah. we'd be playing away and having a great time with it. Again, driving my mother insane. Uh, but that was sort of like, that was the first time that I was sharing a musical space. It wasn't just uh, rhythm and drums and hitting things. It was, we were, we were creating in our minds, we were creating something. There was this musical thing and we felt great doing it. Of course, accordion and drums wasn't a big seller back then and so he went out and he got a bass guitar and that's when we started uh, you know we had found a, a fellow two guys actually to play guitar a guitar and a keyboard player and uh very first song i ever learned how to play in its entirety was cinnamon girl and uh and and i you know and i scored it out and i, I thought it was basically the same beat through the whole thing didn't matter that at that age, I mean, I scored it all out and 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 we could play this thing together. And then we played down on the corner. And um, our, our guitar player was like, ding, 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 ding. It was horrible. But we played it once and we played it right. It, at least at that time in our minds, we played it right. But it felt so good. It, it was like, this is so cool. This is why I should be doing this. And it never occurred to me that... I could, could or would want to do anything else. Uh, I think everybody I know has had that conversation with their parents where they say playing music and all that kind of stuff. That's, that's really fun, but you should go to university, get a degree so that you have something to fall back on, all that kind of stuff. And yes, I had that conversation with my parents, but it, to me, it was, it was almost a waste of time because it just never occurred to me that I would want to do something else. Uh, now, of course, later on in, in life, th things change in, the, in that regard, but um, it was always in pursuit of sitting in a room with other people and creating that amazing feeling that was the catalyst for just about every musical situation I ever got into. Uh, we're always looking for that feeling. And even to this day, when I'm on stage with anybody, that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for that feeling where it just, it locks in. Uh, it, it's hard to explain to people that when the bass player hits that that low D, let's say, and and the kick drum is just at, at the exact right spot and the way that it feels in my in my monitors or the way that it feels on the stage, or if I can hear the slap back coming from the, from the audience, that, that thing that when the bass player and the drummer are locked in, it's just an amazing feeling. It's, it's, uh, it's a different kind of drug, and but it's an audible drug. And when you lock in a whole night like that, that is just an, an amazing feeling. So that was always the catalyst of, of, of my pursuit. And it wasn't about music. It wasn't that I heard something that I wanted to sing to or anything like that. It was that, that thing of locking together. So from an early age, which is where your question comes from, uh, I somehow recognized that. I, I recognized that it was the the combination of the people in the room playing together and creating a, a space. And sometimes that space was <laughs> just pure cacophony, but we were all in the same space together, right? Uh, and it was, it was a phenomenal feeling. And that that was the pursuit then and still is today. And did that original band where you were playing CCR, did, did you guys have a band name? Uh, that band, I, you know what, I, I, I cannot remember the name of that band. The first band name that I remember was with a different guitar player and, uh, it, the band name was Fantasy Express. That's and, solid. Oh, well, uh, yeah, I guess they, they, I had a double kick bass drum at the time. And so it, what we had is we had a train that was coming across. I had someone that did some artwork and they, and they drew a, a train so that on the one hand, the train was coming to you and the other one was going away. And uh, so on the one bass drum was fantasy. On the other side was express fantasy express. Uh, that, that name sticks with me today. I, I laugh about it. It's, it's like, <laughs> and when you were starting to learn to play the drums, when you're starting to play with other musicians, were there drummers that you looked to, uh, that that really inspired you so you looked out and there were drummers and bands that 
had already made it and showed you what the pinnacle of your instrument could be if you dedicated your life to it, if you really practiced, if you took those lessons. Any Anyone stand out back then to you? Uh, well, there would be a few. Uh, the first one that comes to mind, and, and, and I'm only I'm digging into what really comes to mind. Uh, the first one would be um, Ian Pace from Deep Purple, um, and and I because I, I the Machine Head I think came out in 1974, so I would have been 14, and it was I, I used to I used to sit down, I'd listen to Lazy for just on repeat. I just you know I, I had the vinyl and I would go back and I put it, and then the you know, space trucking came by. Uh, I loved listening to that. Um, I also let's say that like, there were three albums that I remember playing over and over and over and over and over. And uh, the second one I think was the first album from Queen, uh, and I can't remember what that album was called. And uh, and the third album, uh, oh yeah, it might have been Schools Out from Alice Cooper, and I, I think uh, uh, Neil Neil was the drummer Neil hmm, something Neil or Neil. Uh, those were I really looked up to them uh, a lot, and in particular Ian Pace. I used to think that when when um, when Live in Japan came out, I, I used to think, well, there's 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 that's what I want to do. That's where I want, I want to be as good as that guy. Um, then uh, it changed, it evolved when someone came along and introduced me to ELP. So Emerson, Lake and Palmer. So Carl Palmer was all of a sudden became uh, the drummer that I wanted to be because he had more drums than you could shake a stick at. And he had gongs and, and he could play for hours on end. Uh, and I, I don't know if you're familiar with that album. There's an album called, um, welcome back my friends to the show that never ends. It's a it's a three album live thing and it, it's phenomenal. It's just really great. You know, Keith Emerson was a, an amazing player. Um, but right around that same time, when I was 14, 15 years old, a friend of mine by the name of John Zylak shifted my life over completely and introduced me to Miles Davis. And the 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 album that he introduced me to was Four and More with Tony Williams playing drums. Now that's that's very different from pop music, uh, and and all of a sudden I went from listening to my rock gods to listening to Lenny White, Billy Cobham, Tony Williams, uh, I, I, everybody from that from that era and earlier as well. So I was also listening to guys like Art Blakey. Uh, and now this was, I mean, it was a different thing. It was a different kind of music. It was a different kind of drumming. It was very light. Uh, and I, but these people were expressing themselves in a way that, that rock drummers weren't mainly because they weren't confined to the, to the two and four and the backbeat and, you know, playing the, the song structure in a pop format uh, that changed my life because now I'm playing music, which is completely foreign to to what I've been playing for a long time. And that all of a sudden, these new drummers that I'm listening to brings in a new kind of music. And after listening to that for a while, uh, pulling away, all of a sudden now I'm listening to some of the progressive rock that's, that's happening. And so a whole list of new drummers come into my palette. So uh, over a span of 10 years, there was a whole pile of different drummers that came to the forefront of, of what I was listening to. So we we have a bunch of fan questions that were sent in. And this one is from Leslie Francis. And sh her question is, I'd love to know what bands he listened to growing up. So you mentioned the music you were listening to where it was the drummer that influenced you. Uh, outside of that, are there any other bands that you listen to? I guess maybe... Um, where it wasn't the drummer that that hooked you in and influenced you so you, um, you you might have kind of answered her question already but i i well, want to give her a shout out for asking yeah i i would say um albums that i listened to a lot would have would have been um definitely the white album from the beatles that was that was way up there uh at the time i would have been listening to a lot of uh alice cooper probably the the first and second records from Alice Cooper that, that they had a regular turn. Um, another band called Bebop Deluxe. I don't know if, you're, if, you're, if you remember them, they were really great to listen to. Uh, they, they were, they would have been on the constant, you know, what, what album am I going to listen to? And that's when I'm going to listen to and listen to this. Um, I would probably say maybe the surprising album 
growing up that I listened to music wise um, would have been Johnny Mathis. <laughs> and it, it, there was just, a, there was one, I, I can't remember the tune, but there was just this one tune that to me, just musically, I guess the way that they recorded it, whatever, it sat in that pocket that I was telling you about. And I used to listen to that all the time. It was my mother's record. I, I stole it and I, I'd listen to it. Uh, but I would say probably on a regular basis, like the, what al- the White Album was something I listened to constantly. So you, you mentioned being a big fan of Alice Cooper. Uh, what's what's cool is just the other day, I started promoting this episode that we were going to be doing this interview. And that's how I got all the fan questions sent in. And suddenly out of nowhere, Alice Cooper's guitarist liked uh, the 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 promotion I was doing for the Crash Test Dummies interview out of nowhere, like nowhere, you know, in three years, this guy's never liked anything, didn't know his existence. And then suddenly he comes in. So I don't know if he's he's a Crash Test Dummies fan or something, but uh, he started liking uh, the, the posts that involve you. So oh, I, don't wow. know what, I don't know what that means, but wouldn't that be cool? Yeah, absolutely. I'd have I'll have to go and uh dig deeper into uh him and and uh how long he's been with Alice Cooper. Alice Cooper is like a a shockingly good songwriter. So people see him as, you know, kind of the godfather godfather of shock rock and they see him as this one thing. But outside of that, he's written hit songs for like Celine Dion and all these artists that are are not in the rock genre. Yeah, I had no idea. Yeah, he's he's like a legit singer songwriter outside of the image that he has oh well i I, the image was one thing i i I just i liked the energy of those songs like i remember school is out or or i'm 18 and and for me that that uh maybe it's because i where i was in life i I just you know and i I, wow this is this is you know school's out it was just it's there's um there was there was songwriting and rebellion at the same time. No more and, Mr. Nice Guy, which goes along yeah. with what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like a, a lot of they they all brought something to the table that was uh, rebellious, but not 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 over the top where you want to throw TVs out the window, right? You just you know we can we can all kind of get it like the Wall, you know, from Pink Floyd. It's 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 rebellious, uh, but without destroying things. So let's let's dive into your career with Crash Test Dummies. So the the band released demos in 1988 and 1989, and you joined in 1991. How how did you meet the other members? How did you know they were looking for a drummer? Did you have to audition? I have so many questions, Mitch. <laughs> First of all, uh, <clears throat> when they so you you know the story. Obviously, you've looked it up. When Brad was looking. For, he he would had the song called, sorry, let me back up again. Let me try to learn how to speak English. Um, Brad's original band was Bad Brad Roberts and the St. James Rhythm Pigs. And that was, they were doing something. It was a lark. They were, it was a bunch of university students. They were just having some good fun. And then he wanted to get a little bit more serious about it. So he wrote some songs. They wanted to go out and they, uh, play a, a festival. So they had the first Crash Test Dummies demo, and they sent it off to Mariposa Festival, which is in, in Ontario. Richard Flohill, who was uh, the director, I think, at the time, got this tape and said, wow, this 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 band is, is really cool. And so he sent it off to BMG. BMG, the a- a- A&R people at BMG, uh, I, which I believe might have been David Bendith at the time, said, hey, this is really cool. Let's look into these guys. And uh, through the whole process, la di da da boom, they got a record deal. Now, uh, Vince Lambert, who was the original drummer for Crash Test Dummies at that point in time, there were a few guys in there, but he was the guy that was playing with them at that particular point in time. Um, for whatever reason, uh, he, I, he loved the ground I walked on. Uh, I, I don't know why. I don't know what it is. He saw me play somewhere or something. If I walked in and he was playing a gig, he would get nervous. Uh, if, if I went over and talked to him, he was, he just turned into like a total like, oh, bitch is talking to me. And I don't know where that came from, but he always spoke very highly of me all the time. And we used to play at a place in Winnipeg called the Blue Note Cafe, which which really was after everyone finished playing their gigs at the at the local clubs. Everybody would congregate over to the to the Blue Note at one o'clock in the morning, and we w- would all play till four or five in the morning every night. 
pretty much you could go there on any night and we'd all be there playing. And uh, so Brad would be there. Uh, Dan, Dan was there. Uh, Vince would be there. Ellen was there. Uh, not all necessarily all playing, but sometimes just hanging out. And over the course of time, we all got to know each other fairly well. And um, when it became apparent that that Vince wasn't really working out in in the band in terms of you know the direction that they were going and what their expectations were, uh, it just was logical at the time that they might want to ask me because I was they I was held in high regard from Vince, and and perhaps maybe they held me in some regard as well. Um, however. I was really busy. I, I was I was doing a lot of things. I was playing in four or five different bands. I had just come back from Europe playing with the Jacques Lucier band. I was having a great time. And I, not that I, I, I would say that I wasn't interested in it only because I was just really busy. I was doing a lot of things. And uh, they had held auditions and they'd settled on somebody. And uh, he turned around sort of last minute like literally last minute and said, another opportunity has come up for me. I'm, I'm bailing. And this came right at a time when they were going down to do a BMG convention in the Cayman islands. So Brad called me up and said, Hey, look, I need you to do me a favor, Mitch. Uh, we're going down to the Cayman islands. We're doing this BMG convention. Uh, you know, can you, can you come and do it with us? Like, we'll pay you whatever you want, but we just, we want to make sure that this goes off really well. And we think you're the guy to do it. And I, I, sorry, man, I, I at the time, I think it was April 8th. Ask me why I remember that. I have no idea, but I think it was April 8th. And I said, Brad, I, I can't do it. Like I'm, I'm going to be in Europe with, with Jacques. And I guess you can call it a universe thing, but I, I put the phone down in talking to Brad and the phone was still in my hands, this old rotary phone, and uh, and, it, and it rang. And I picked it up, and it was Jacques telling me that a couple of the, the festivals that we were going to Europe to do uh, wouldn't sign a contract, and so therefore he didn't want to potentially lose his shirt, and so we're not going. Okay, so I called Brad back. Like, this is all in the span of about two and a half minutes. And I called Brad back and say, hey, I, wouldn't you know it, as luck would have it, situations changed. I'd love to go down and and, uh, do this gig with you. So uh, on the way down there was the first time that I really had an opportunity to hang outside the late night hang with the blue note and everything else and and talk about um, what a record contract meant. And, And they were, you know, Brad and Dan at the time who I was talking with mostly at the time. And of course, Ellen um, were such grounded people. And I thought, wow, like this is this would be a really great situation to be involved with because they're not going around going, hey, we got a record deal, we got a record deal. And uh, so on the way back, I, I discussed with them and I said, look, like if you guys are interested, I, I could I would be happy to make this like my priority, my priority gig. And uh, we never looked back after that. Uh, so we got together, we played, and originally. I was the drummer. Uh, was, I wasn't part of Crash Test Dummies. I was the hired drummer. And when we got into the making of God Shuffled His Feet is when everything changed. And uh, what I brought to the table was more than just being a, a drummer. And uh, and, it, and it grew from there. So uh, we knew each other from playing out and being in the same place at the time, we knew a lot of the same people. And uh, it, it was it was just a, a really good fit, right? From the very first show we played, there was just a really nice feeling on stage. And that, for me, was worth pursuing. It's funny, the more I interview musicians, the more the same people show up in the story. So David Bendith has shown up in quite a few stories with the history of Treble Charger, with the history of Breaking Benjamin, and then he shows up here today, which is cool. Uh, I thought it was cool that you mentioned that Brad originally was in a band that wasn't that serious. It was was kind of comedic or a joke or something. I, I feel like that sense of humor has carried through with the crash test dummies, which is one of the things that makes the band unique. Do you, do you agree with that? Absolutely. 100%. Brad is a very smart boy. Uh, He's got a double honors degree in literature and, and philosophy. 
and uh, and he's he sees the world in, in a very interesting way. And uh, songwriting became something to him. I mean, it was a muse, but it was also something that he just really enjoyed. And it was a, a great outlet to to put songs together and 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 be creative. And the more that uh, that I worked with with him, uh, the more you realize like he's just he's a really creative force, but he's unique. He's not trying to be anything else. He's he is Brad Roberts. And you know, you know, I could probably sit and I could listen to you know, five songs that he's written for people. And and uh even if they performed him, and I would kind of go, ah, you know what, that's that's got some Bradley in there. And you would you would pick it out. And which is really the kind of thing, you know, in the world of music, that's what you want. You want that thing that's unique. So when he was doing that, he was going through university with like Brad Bad Rob Barts and the St. James Rhythm Pigs. And even with the Crash Test Dummies, it was like I'm having some fun doing this. Uh, you know, if we can play someplace other than Winnipeg, it would be it would be fabulous. So it really was. It was it was fun. He wasn't searching for the for the record deal. He wasn't searching for fame and fortune. So uh, a little bit earlier, you mentioned the importance of locking in with a rhythm section. That that's kind of what you're you're always striving for. Uh, so I have some kind words that are sent in from someone you've been locking in to place with for a very long time. So this is from Dan Roberts, the bass player for Crash Test Dummies. Uh, he says, Mitch is an excellent drummer and bandmate for many reasons. One of the things I appreciate most about him is that he brings a positive attitude and positive energy to everything we do, including to the stage every night. So that's from Dan Roberts. Wow. It's, yeah, again, I, I radiate, I melt, I have a tear. Uh, <laughs> No, I and, I and I and I say that with with total sincerity. Uh, if I'm gonna if I'm gonna pin down Dan in particular, um, very often someone will ask the question, "Who's the best drummer? Who's the best bass player? Who's the best this? Who's the best that?" And I cringe every time that it happens. Every time, uh, to me, like there is there is no best. Uh, you know who who would be a better drummer for Rush than Neil, right? But who would be the best drummer for, uh, I, I was going to say Foo Fighters, but I, I'm going to go back, uh, you know, let's let's say, um, uh, you want to go back to, well, it's slipping me right now, help me out, Kurt Cobain. Um, Nirvana. Nirvana, thank you very much. Uh, you know, who, who would have been better than David Grohl for that band? Right. Nobody they, they, like David Grohl was the guy. And, uh, you know, who's the best bass player for for Crash Test Dummies? Well, it's Dan Roberts. And and uh, and and why? Because he understands the music. He knows the music. He knows he knows where the time should be. Uh, you could put another bass player in there and he could play notes. He could play everything else. But he's not going to play anywhere near as as Dan. Is, is, is where he places the note, how he hears the music, how he's listening to me and how he locks in. Dan's ears are like, they're huge. Uh, he hears everything that's going on on stage. It's not unlike Dan to come to me at the end of the night and say, you know, back in, you know, two years ago, we were playing at Harpo's or whatever. And you did this little fill thing that, that it was really cool. Do you remember that? And pff, like just gone and then i'll think about it think about it think about it then i'll find it and then i'll say i'm going to throw it in tonight see if dan hears it and sure i do it turns over gives me a big smile and and you go who could be better than this and to get a compliment from dan is 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 just totally heartwarming i mean it's it's gratitude out the yin yang for to, to, to get kind words from dan so in preparation for this interview, I went back, I listened to the entire Crash Test Dummies discography. That's a lot of music. I had my good headphones on. I soaked it in. And one thing that becomes apparent is Dan's bass playing. I mean, it is he, he might be the most underrated bass player in, in rock music because his bass playing is so unique and so tasty. And a lot of the hooks uh, in the, in some of the singles are, are his bass playing the tone. Uh, so I was, I was really impressed. It was one of the things that really stood out to me. And we'll, we'll talk about your drums and the amazing drum sound as, as we go. That's another thing that stood out, but uh, yeah, I was really impressed with Dan's bass playing. 
Well, and I think as people should be, uh, first of all, he, he hears things in a way that a lot of people don't. Uh, he, he hears beyond just the basic, you know, line that he figures that he wants to play. Secondly, Dan is super open. If you're playing with him and you hear something, he's super open to the idea of, oh, okay, I didn't think of that. You're suggesting that I try it this way. I'll try it this way. And then he'll try it that way. And then he'll, he'll, you know, analyze it and say, you know what, it's not working for me. What if we kind of put the two ideas together and, and make that work? Then it's a matter of where, where he sits. And Dan's bass playing, like that's another thing. One of the, a great compliment that was given to me once uh, by my friend Daniel Kulak was saying that if he was walking through a folk festival and he walked by a tent and there were eight people in that tent playing spoons, he'd know which one was me. Uh, you know, just by just where where I hear the time, how I hear the time. And it's the same thing with Dan. Uh, Dan, the way that he where he hears the time, where he hears the note falling, uh, how he hears the note accenting the music is very, very Dan Roberts. Like no one hears it like he does. And which and, and I think you're right. It's very evident when you listen to the recordings. Right. You go, wow. Like, where's where's he coming from? So the band releases its debut major label album in 1991. So the ghosts that haunt me. So I'll just rattle off some of the numbers here. So four singles, Superman song, the ghosts uh, that haunt me, androgynous and winter song. The album goes to number two in Canada, goes four times platinum. Superman song goes to number four in Canada. So you didn't play on that album, but you were a part of the touring promotion machine that you you were there as that album came out and as it took off you were a part of that ride so what thoughts memories emotions come back to you when you think back to that debut album that really kick-started this crazy adventure you've been on for the last 30 plus years uh, that's a question that we hear not often enough um uh, in terms of you know where our headspace was at that time first of all um Crash Test Dummies always has been, and I can't see any reason why it always will, will, will be any different at any point in the future. Always concerned about the music and what's going on on stage. There were big things happening, and we were oblivious to it. We really were. Um, we, you know, a, a, a Superman song was going through the roof. We were doing these constant interviews uh, you know, we'd go places and everybody was, you know, singing Superman song and, and we'd go to Blockbuster and there were like big long lineups for people coming to get autographs and everything else. And and our thought process was, well, what, what time is sound check? Because we got to make sure that everything sounds great for tonight. And we'd, we'd play the show. And after the show, there'd be some conversation about, uh, you know, what went really great tonight, what didn't go really great tonight. And and uh, we'd go and we'd play. And it was, it was always about the music and not about the 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 consequences of the album sales and and everything else um which which for us you know people would come along and say oh you guys are famous and, and be like well i don't know are we it, like, it wasn't it wasn't a, it wasn't a thing so during that whole ride in that particular time with that album it was it was like wow like we're playing enough that uh it seems evident that people like us and, and people might come out to our shows and, and, and maybe that's going to pave the way we can make a second record <laughs> and, and, you know, and maybe express ourselves musically in, in another way. And God shoveled his feet was way bigger than, uh, than the first album. Uh, and it, and it did, it, it paved a way for us to, to play music and express ourselves. And that's where our heads were at. It wasn't about, the you know the lifestyle that could potentially come with this or any of that kind of stuff it was about like this is really a lot of fun we can have a lot of fun doing this when you first heard the final recorded version of superman's song did you did you think hey man this could be a huge hit i mean it's it's a great song but it's not like anything else out there um did did could you somehow predict that this would be this massive massive top 5 song in canada uh, the short answer is no. <laughs> yeah. uh, the long answer is I. <clears throat> it, no, the, the, this is me talking here, and, and don't let it speak for everybody else. I don't know that anyone is really 
capable of predicting what a hit is going to be. Um, very often, and, I, and I'm not slagging the music industry, very often, if you go back to the 1950s, 1960s, there was an a and guy that went over and, and, and saw a band, and that band would be really lively on stage, and they had a good beat, and there was character. And uh, you know, like, say, for instance, the discovering of Elvis Presley, uh, there, there's something there you can really see it's tangible, and you say, I, I can sell this. I think this is going to be really cool. This is going to be the next big, big thing. But by the 1990s, um, the music industry was in such a way that, and, and still is to a large degree, they don't, they, we know statistically what has sold. So there was a time when, and I can recrack this when we get into God Shuffle His Feet, but um, there was a time when, when people looked at something and they, and they say, well, this is, you know, this sounds like this. And if this sounds like this, well, this was really successful. So we can push this and we're going to sell more, you know, pizza with with pepperoni it's, it's going to be wonderful because it sounds like this um a lot of times you listen to a song and you go eh, I, I don't know i don't know about this song I don't, I don't know what's going to happen with it and for some reason it takes off and everybody loves the song and you're kind of going i'm not really sure why everybody loves the song but i'm glad that they do um but to write a song and and think it's a double-edged sword. On the one hand, if you're writing a song that you think, if you're writing a song because you want it to be a hit, uh, wrong reasons for writing a song. Because if you don't like that song, if it's not an extension of something that you that you feel that uh, an integral that you have a lot of integrity in, and that song makes it as as, as what we could call a hit, you're going to be playing that song every night for for thirty years. And, and uh, you better like it, because <laughs> if you don't, it's going to be torture. But if you're writing songs that you like and they take off, then every night to play that song, you know, every night we've been playing Superman song for 30 years, and I enjoy it every night that we play it. I, I approach it like it's the very first time that I'm going to play it, because I know that a lot of our audience, this is the first time they've ever heard it. And so therefore, I'm going to play it the same way. I mean, it's like it's fresh and, and beautiful, and I, and I like the song. It's a good song. Brad's a good writer. Um, but when we were doing it, it's a ballad. It's sung by a bass baritone. It's about a superhero. Doesn't really have a strong dance beat, right? If you want to use all the criteria from uh, American Bandstand, uh, there were a lot of things going against it. Uh, the fact that the the people loved it so much was a was a bit of a surprise for for me. Maybe for others, they I knew it all the time, but for me, it was a bit of a surprise. Uh, but uh, honestly, at the time. I was just really grateful that, that, uh, that you know, we had something, we had uh, a, a hook to hang our hat on. What, what makes Superman's song even more improbable as a hit is in 1991, that was at the, the pinnacle of popularity for grunge. So the biggest albums in the world, there's a Nirvana, Nevermind, Metallica, the black album, Pearl Jam 10, uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers, Blood, Sex, Sugar, Magic. Like that's the sound of 1991. And then there's this Canadian band with this basically acoustic song uh, and it becomes a massive hit just to show how improbable it is. Yeah, it, it, it was like really weird stuff working. I'm not going to say working against it, but it was like you say, it was it was a, a weird fish in the pond. And, uh, you know, the fact that someone pulled it out is, is, is pretty cool, of which I'm thankful for. But, uh, yeah, your original question being, could I have predicted that it would have been as successful as it was? Absolutely not. So a year after the album comes out, 1992, you guys win the Juno for Group of the Year. That's probably that's one of the most prestigious of the Juno Award categories. What does that Juno Award mean to you? Well, <laughs> I'm of two minds when it comes to awards. Uh, one is the awards at that particular point in time were mostly industry driven. And so, it, you know, if a band had really high album sales and they were really popular uh, and then so, you know, that kind of generated, oh, well, if we tag a Juno onto this, the album sales are going to go up more and, and record companies were making more money. And, and and the whole record company thing is a different conversation. But at that particular point in time, it was really great that we were being recognized 
for something that we did. I don't think any of us looked at it and said that we're like, we're now validated because we have a Juno award. I, everybody, I think approached it in a, in a very wholesome way and said, wow, uh, th th this is a great stepping stone to, to, you know, having more listeners and, and being recognized for something that we've done, we've, you know, we've contributed, but it didn't validate it. You know what I mean? Uh, sometimes the, for some people getting that award validates that, okay, I'm good. I'm, I'm this, uh, nobody in the band looked at it that way. We looked at it as, as a, as a kind reward for efforts made and, you know, can we, can we do it again? Yeah. It's, it's, it's nice to be, to have the country in which you grew up in acknowledge your hard work and your talents and yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know what? A lot of people really came forward and, and, and were like super fans, no pun intended. Uh, they were, they were amazing super fans and, and we'd go places and the support that we got, was absolutely fabulous. So in 1993, you guys put out the follow-up album, So God Shuffled His Feet. The success of this album is insane. So I'm going to rattle off some stats and then we'll dig deep into this album. So there's four singles and we were joking earlier about how I'm supposed to say the title. So, mm -hmm. okay, so mm -hmm, mm -hmm. a number one single, uh, Swimming in Your Ocean, afternoons and coffee spoons and then god shuffled his feet so all four singles were top 20 hits in canada the first single went to number four on billboard hot 100 that is the chart globally essentially if you're number four on that chart that is as big as it gets uh the album goes top 10 in the u.s three times platinum in canada two times platinum in the u.s the album goes either gold platinum or multi-platinum in 11 different countries and it sells over 8 million copies worldwide so all of this sounds like complete insanity to start then it gets nominated for three grammys which is as prestigious as an award nomination you can get as a musician and then three more juno awards so my question with all of that now out there in the ether my question is <laughs> Almost no human being will ever experience that level of success with an album in the music industry. Can you try to put into words what your life was like at the peak of that success for the rest of us peasants that just have no idea what that's like? Uh, again, I'm going to reiterate what I said earlier and that for, for the band, it was always about the music and we were in situations. I mean, we went from playing uh, you know, maybe Massey Hall in 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 Toronto, which is which is prestigious and and uh, a, a wonderful gig to play. Maybe the to, best sounding venue in the world. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, just it, well, it, you know, we played Albert Hall in 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 London, and that's. I mean, you just look out there and and you're just in awe. Um, but we went we went from doing that to playing to. Uh, with our our personal record was 110,000 people in Tipperary Island, right? Um, but in both cases, whether it was Massey Hall or Tipperary, or the you know we played a lot of arena shows, we played a lot of of uh, of shed shows. I don't maybe your listeners don't know what sheds are. Sheds are a, a big outdoor venues, but they're covered, uh, so they're they're generally you can put the thirty five thousand people out there, but it's it's not like a stadium or an arena. It's a an outdoor kind of an amphitheater, which is so they're called sheds. And we were playing sheds, and uh, on every, every night, uh, our concern was making sure that the show was was as good as it can be. Uh, every every night, it was you know Dan looking over at me, going, "Okay, let's let's lock in. Are we feeling like are we feeling the lock?" And and uh, so uh, we we traveled first class in a lot of cases um, because that's what the industry dictated at the time. And in a lot of cases, it made sense because we had to cover a lot of ground. I mean, we were, we were, we were playing like a show in Toronto and then Vancouver and then Los Angeles and then New York. And then we'd be in Minneapolis and then we're in London and then we're in South Africa and then we're in China. And, and, and if you're not careful, you burn out really quickly. So you have to sort of alleviate, uh, alleviate the stress and the pace by hanging out and, 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 you know, traveling the most comfortable way that you can. Uh, so you just don't burn out. Uh, but still, our goal was always about the music and and what we were bringing to the table. Now, 
uh, I'll interject a little story in there because it is, it is kind of funny just to show you that we really had no idea of where we were in life. Uh, we, I can't remember the city. Um, and I'm going to, I'm going to say just for the sake of argument, I'm going to say that it's Denver. And uh, so we had two tour buses. We had our bus and then we had the, the crew bus and we pulled in behind the hotel that we we're staying in. And when we pulled into the parking lot, um, the, 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 there, there was probably like 2000 screaming fans, mostly girls in the parking lot, like losing their minds when we, when we pulled in. And so we looked at each other and we said, Oh, Hey, wow. We, we must be doing pretty good in, in, you know, in, in Denver to have this happening. And uh, so <clears throat> the bus door opens up and I think it was either Dan or it was Brad, the first one to step off the bus and, and uh, the, the crowd kind of calmed down a little bit. Like they, they, they lost their minds for like 30 seconds and then they calmed down a little bit and we could hear one person going, Oh, well, that must be the crew. And it was like, what do you mean? It must be the crew. So, we managed to pulled in, we went and checked out, checked in at the desk, and went up into our rooms. And uh, about maybe an hour and a half later, th the screams started again, and they were like lost their minds. Well, they the bus that was pulling in then was in sync, <laughs> and so all these fans were there to see in sync. Had no idea. Maybe one of them might have known who we were, uh, but it was. For me, that was very sobering uh, at the time because a when we pulled in, we did not expect any fans to be there, and when there were, we were really surprised by it. And and you know, like oh wow, this is this is this is this is wonderful. We're we're rock stars. And and then humbling when they, we get off the thing and they go, oh, that's that must be the crew. <laughs> it turns and, out they're looking for Justin Timberlake. So. Yeah, and 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 then you realize that you know here's here's the boy band that that's, that's leaving you in the dust. So that was that was all a lot of a lot of our touring life was was like that, just sobering moments. And and uh, where let's let's just focus on the music and play the show the best that we can. So you know, was it was it um, was it the rock star life where we live in lavish lives? Uh, no, not at all. We we're I, I think everybody, as I said, when on that flight back from the Bahamas or from the Cayman Islands, uh, very sobering, very everybody very grounded in terms of of what it means and where it's going, and and you know don't get too big for your britches kind of a thing, uh, and humbling moments like that where it just keeps everything in check. For the concert with one hundred and ten thousand people, when you're behind your drum kit. You look out, there's that many people. W what was that moment like? Is that too many people where it's it's like it's hard to connect with them? Or is it just, is it overwhelming? Does it feel great that there's so many people there to see your band? What's what's going through your head? Uh, well, three things. Uh, number one, on when you're playing to that many people, you're on a really big stage. And so everybody on that stage is like really far away. So there's probably maybe 25, 30 feet between me and Brad. And then there's another 20 feet from Brad to the front of the stage. And then there's like the security barriers and everything else, where it's probably another 30 feet from between that and the first audience person. So everything is fairly spread out. And my concern every night when we're on stage, my concern is Dan Roberts. And and uh, and I'll look over to see that Stuart is, is, is ready. Um, I want the whole show to go by with Brad never having to look back. I want him to be completely comfortable so that he can just do whatever he wants to do and uh, not think about what's happening back here. So then he says, okay, let's go. Then we can just launch. So I'm really focused on what's happening on stage. Uh, number two, when you look at that many people, it's just, it's a sea of people. And, and, uh, and on that particular day, the weather was beautiful everybody was in wonderful spirits. Why were they in wonderful spirits? Well, of that 110 lovely Irish people, I would probably say 70% or more were under the age of 25 and, and, uh, and really enjoying the beer. And mm -hmm. so the energy out there was ridiculous. Just, just the, the, the you know, if you could like put a bubble over top of it and and try to capture that energy, it would have been would have been fantastic. I still to this day I, I remember 
the the it was people climbing on top of people and standing on on, on people's shoulders and when we launched into a song that they knew it, it just came back at you it was uh, it was really really phenomenal i really really enjoyed the show and i wouldn't say that we walked off stage thinking wow we really made it because all these people are here we we said like the energy that came to us really had us reflected back and and it was a fabulous all the way around you do you remember the moment where you found out that you guys were nominated for three Grammys for that album? So I know, you know, it's it's not about judging what music is better than other music. And it's it's not about the awards. It's about the craft itself. But man, the Grammys are so prestigious. Most people will never get nominated for one Grammy. You guys got nominated for three at the same time. Uh, was that a special moment for you or it's just, oh, it's something else that's that's just kind of validating what we're doing well i think when you're when you win awards and and um something like the grammys comes up i mean you're right the the grammys are the the pinnacle when 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 you have grammy attached to your name uh that means that some some pretty heavy people have recognized your efforts and uh, so going to the grammys and being part of that whole thing was uh, a, a pretty neat experience. Doubly for me, uh, actually triple, uh, but doubly because when I sat in my seat, you, know, you get assigned a seat and then you have a car pick you up at the hotel and you go in and you walk the red carpet and 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 uh, people look at you like you're somebody you know, and I'm, oh, I'm a drummer. Uh, and, and you go in and I sat, I sat down in my seat and I turned around and directly behind me was uh, Chick Corea. Now, uh, you know, for, in the pop world, Chick Corea might not be something, but in the jazz world, Chick Corea is pretty much at the top of the heap in terms of, you know, recognition and, and the accomplishments. And I, and I turned around and I, what's Chick Corea doing at the Grammys? Like, this is so awesome. And he's sitting behind me and I turned and I had a chat with him and he talked to me like I was his best friend. And, and um, um, what was the name of the band that Beyonce was in the three girls? Um, uh, Destiny's Child. Destiny's Child. Well, they did the opening, uh, the opening tune at the Grammys. And I, in all my years, had never heard that kind of volume with such clarity. It, 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 it was amazing. And, and I, you know, to, would I say that I'm a Destiny's Child fan? Well, well probably not. Uh, but I sure was that day. Uh, and, and I thought, does this only happen at the Grammys? You know, is it uh, the, the, this kind of quality? They had the uh, best sound engineers in the world working on that. Yeah, one, like no expense spared. Right. It'd be, and, and, and for me, walking around the Grammys and, and all the Grammy parties and, and the way that they do things was was they say, you know, there, there's a reason. And, and, you know, that afternoon at, at the Grammy party, because we did a little thing that night. Um, I mean, I, I was hanging. For, I mean, for me, this was the thing I was hanging. I was with Aretha Franklin. You know, I was I was I was hanging out with Aretha Franklin. Like, you know, she gave me a big hug. And, and for me. Uh, just because of the period that I grew up in, I'm hanging out with Aretha Franklin. And, and don't laugh, but equally fascinating for me was I was also hanging out with Kenny G. And and uh, Kenny G was like the kindest, most soft-spoken human being. Uh, and, 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 you know, we exchanged, I don't know, words over 20 minutes or so. But I was I was like, wow, what a nice human being that is. And then, of course, I would go back and I was I'm, with, I'm standing with Aretha Franklin. How awesome is this? And then, and then you realize that this is this is a party which is designed for the in the industry for the best of the best, and 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 we got to participate in it. We never regarded ourselves as the best of the best. We were very grateful that we were able to to hang out and and be in that room with the best of the best, and and. Uh, I, I would say that hanging out at the Grammys or that period of point in time was where we were able to maybe say, maybe we have done something. Maybe we've really accomplished something here. Maybe we've brought something big to the table. Yeah, the 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 kid from Winnipeg had done pretty well being there with Aretha Franklin and uh, and Kenny. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, so the, fabulous. Yeah, the, the first single from that album. So again, mm, 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 mm. so that's the band's most popular song on Spotify. 186 million spins just on Spotify, not on Apple, not on Tidal, not on YouTube. Why do you think people love that song so much? And can you remember the first time you heard Brad sing that chorus? It, it's just well, it's just iconic, you know? Okay, so um, here we go. Uh, one of the things that we do in Crash Test Dummies is everybody is is a is a is a big boy. Everybody's an adult because Ellen Ellen is Ellen is as 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 much of anything of any of us, and uh, we understand that you know Crash Test Dummies has a, a particular sound, which is everybody that is in the band what they contribute. And but we also know that all the songs in Crash Test Dummies are written by Brad, and he, Brad writes a certain way, has a certain style that he writes. Brad's also very trusting in that he comes to us and he says, "Okay, guys, I, I've written a song. Uh, here's the framework. Have at her, right? You know, like if, if if you think it's great, then then let's make it great uh, greater and if you don't think it's great tell me why let's fix it let's let's make it great so uh there's a number of songs that that we've been working on uh, you know afternoons and coffee spoons and all that kind of stuff and then uh i call it umity 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 just because it's, it's my little thing and uh, so that comes to the table and uh woo now there's going to be a problem here right and the the problem is is i've written this song and these are the words. And I really don't know what the chorus should be right now. Like, I don't have any words for the chorus. So I'm just humming the melody for the, what, what the chorus should be. And then as we continue to work through it, and you look at the subject matter of, of, of what the song is about, well, it kind of makes sense that the chorus would be, you know, doing this kind of a thing. Hmm. Mm, mm, right? That, like, that, that sort of hum moment. So let's let it be that. Uh, now here we are writing this song about kids in general, people with uh, peculiarities, Ch challenges, yeah, yeah, challenges, peculiarities, and uh, we don't have words in 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 the chorus. Now the record company not happy about that at all. Right? They says, how can we how can we put a song out there that has no words in the chorus? It's ridiculous. And uh, again, right, it's it's just pigeonhole thinking, and. Uh, and we, 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 we stuck to our guns, like we really stuck to our guns. And we said, well, no, we don't think it needs, it, like it doesn't need words. We're, we're good with, mm -hmm. and they were really like, oh, come on, you guys, like, this is ridiculous. We have to have words. And they, and they, they didn't like the idea. They fought the idea. Um, David Bendeth actually, you know, he fought the idea. And not because, um, not because he's an idiot or anything like that. It's because that just was unheard of. Right? How could you have a chorus without words? It just doesn't make any sense. This is the music industry. We need people going out there singing the chorus to their favorite song. So uh, we we stuck to our guns. Um, we uh, there's a few other songs in there uh, which we can cover if you want um, that we fought for that we that we said no. This is how the song was written. This is how it's going to be. And the record company just kind of did this right. <laughs> And and eventually, with, with come the other decisions that we made, they decided, okay, you know what, we're just going to put this record out there, and if it does well, fine. But it's not going to do well because there's no lyrics in the chorus. Well, wouldn't you know it? What nobody anticipated at the time is it doesn't matter what language you speak or what language you and the country that you come from. Uh, mm, 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 is singable in any language, in any culture, in any place in the world. And all of a sudden, no matter where we would go, people could sing, right? Not just phonetically, but they could sing the chorus of wherever, of wherever we went. And that really worked out to our advantage. Um, now, having said that, of course, uh, the title track, which is God Shuffled His Feet, if you're familiar with it, the the opening the opening cut has got the little drum thing that stack, and at the time that we were recording that, Annie Lennox 
uh, Y was just coming up and Y was had that just, everything was lush and big and beautiful. And we were kind of mocking that whole thing because a lot of bands were doing that. They're, they're um, assimilating that whole uh, lush, big backbeat groove, big sounds. And, and we said, let's kind of mock it a little bit and, and, and make it tiny and almost insignificant kind of a thing, but still have the groove there. Uh, again, a record company not happy with that because why was doing this thing and we, you should be doing that because that Annie Lennox is selling lots of records with this. So we should, again, we stuck to our guns and, and we had our ideas of what we wanted to do. And, and again, the record company was not happy with us. So uh, things were stacking up uh, against us at that point in time. And the record company had more or less resolved to say, okay, we're going to release it. It's probably not going to do well because there's no hits on this record. And, you know, it's, it's going to come back and we're just, we'll just drop the band and we'll be good. 99X, which is a radio station in Atlanta. I can't remember her last name, but her first name was Linda. She was a radio programmer for 99X. She heard it was either mm -mm -mm or, or God shovel his feet. I can't remember. Or it might have been Afternoons of Coffee Spoons. But she heard a song and she liked it. And so she went to her radio people and said, I want you guys playing this because I think it's good. And so they played it and they played it and they played it. It might have been mm -mm. before you know it, we had sold like 150,000 records just in Atlanta. Whoa. And wouldn't you know that Minneapolis had the sister radio station to, to Atlanta. And so they started really pushing it. And before you know it, we had sold like over 150,000 records just in Minneapolis. And it was growing and it was growing. Well, wouldn't you know it, <laughs> Clive Davis, who was with Arista Records at the time, that's the label that we were on in the US, after being signed with them for four years, looked over and said, hey, who are these guys, right? Like they're selling a lot of records in, in Atlanta and selling a lot of records over here. Let's let's get behind this because they're selling a lot of records. Well, of course they got behind it, uh, started getting lots of radio play across America. And a lot of it had to do with the fact that it was just so easy to sing to. Right? He says, mm -mm, and it was quirky and it was sung by a bass baritone. And it was about a subject matter that wasn't about, you know, lost love or, 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 you know, get your, get your sexy boots on. Uh, it, it, all these things started just building this wall of, of um, momentum. It built a wave of, of momentum that you couldn't argue with at the time. And now add on to that, that, in Los Angeles, they had the earthquake. And so the radio station, K-Rock, which is arguably the biggest radio station in California, had to shut down for three weeks because of the earthquake. And so they had a loop that played every two hours, of which Amity 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 was one of the songs that played all the time. And so it was getting the exposure and, and and here's this like quirky little song that was getting this exposure that people were going. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And at first they were kind of mocking it and laughing about it. But now we go out and we play shows in, in the US and Europe and everything else. And that is what people they, they play. Oh, are you going to play the mm -hmm, mm -hmm song? And, and they love it because they can just sing along to it so casually. And, and and of course, anybody who has grown up with you know, any sort of peculiarity, you know, they, maybe they liked blue hair and because they were being rebellious um, or they had, you know, some sort of weird birthmark or, or whatever. They identified with the song, with the music right away. And so they just helped it grow. But of course, all these circumstances led to those things being discovered and heard and played. Whereas in a lot of cases that you wouldn't, that wouldn't happen. Yeah, I was looking through some of the comments for the uh, the music video on YouTube, and a lot of the comments were saying things like, this song helped me get through my childhood. So it had that kind of effect with the lyrical content. And you're talking about how this song keeps building and things keep uh, showing up in its favor. Uh, we have a fan question about something else that came along that kept promoting it uh, even further into the future. So we have a question from Sly Montgomery. His question is, how cool was it having Weird Al Yankovic cover one of your songs? To me, it would be an honor. 
Oh, it was beyond an honor for us. It really was. I mean, first of all, Al is a, a, an extremely uh, kind human being. And uh, before he does anything like that, he contacts you, like he contacts management and he says, hi, it's Weird Al. <laughs> so, you know, something's up right away. And, uh, you know, I, I here's the Somebody Emity song. Uh, I would like to do, you know, the Al Yankovic spin on it. Are you guys okay with that? And so, what? <laughs> Are you kidding me? Yes. Like have at her. Let's go. And, and, uh, and, and, and he took it. And uh, you know, when he sent it back to us, I mean, we sat, we laughed because we also hear the other side that there's quite a few people that he's approached about covering their songs and they say no, because they, they don't want their lyrics hacked or made fun of. And uh, we did much music in Toronto and uh, Al came and did it with us. Right. And he had the wig and he did the Brad Roberts eye thing. And it was, it was, it was phenomenal. It was like, it was so wonderful to get out there and and play with Weird Al on on one of our songs and, and that he just kind of fit right into because he, he just kind of got it right um and then the two of them together like Brad and Weird Al I don't know if you ever saw the the clip on YouTube but it's it's hilarious and that for that was for us I think a moment of we must be doing okay right if if Weird Al is covering one of our tunes we must be doing okay yeah, because he was he he makes it a point to cover the biggest artists in the world. I mean, his biggest hits are covering Michael Jackson and, and Nirvana. So when you have crash test dummies, you, you must know that you guys at that point in time were essentially the biggest thing in the world, which is unbelievable. Yeah, I don't know about the biggest thing in the world, but, you know, biggest thing in my living room anyway. <laughs> uh, I, I wanted to touch on your drum sounds. So. Man, the sound of your drums on that album are in, in, incredible. Uh, your snare sound might be one of my favorite snare sounds of all time. Can, can you give a little bit of insight into how you get such pop, such snap uh, on your snare and on the rest of the drum kit? Was there some a specific kit you're using? Is it your style of playing? Well, I, I'd like to, I, I would really, I would love to sit here and say, yeah, yeah, baby, it's all me. It's all, all me, me, baby. Yeah, I'm it. I'm it. I'm the, I'm the guy. Uh, no, I do have, uh, you know, a particular tuning that I use with all my drums. Uh, and, and when I say all my drums, all my snare drums, I have a lot of, I have a nice collection of snare drums, uh, but I tend to tune them a certain way. Uh, I, I, up, they're, they're all very, very tight sounding drums now uh, take that take the way that i play which is going to add something on god shoulders feet uh dan harjung was one of the engineers and pat murphy was uh, another engineer now pat murphy we I, we cut most of the drums 90 percent of the drums we cut we cut with pat murphy and uh you know we would go in and uh, I, I think I had three drums that I used, three snare drums that I used on that album. And um, we would go back and we would pick and choose. And, and we'd say, well, like, let's let's do a take with this one. Let's do a take with this one and see see which one has the, you know, the right feel for this, this song. And uh, he was really, both Dan Harjung and Pat Murphy were, were really quite um, kind of like drum sound geeks, if that, if that, makes any sense to you like they they love they could sit there and 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 toy with drums all day long so now you so you've got a combination of of my tuning with the way that i play with the way that they record with the, like with the, with the way that they interpret what i do and then uh that sounded pretty darn good like right off the hop and then we brought tom lord algae in and uh tom uh, he's like he just loves drums uh any anybody that he's ever any mix anywhere that you find that tom lord algae has done the drums just pop out yeah because he loves the drums it's not just a it's not just a thing for him they give him good drums and he's just a happy guy uh so you know he kind of put the 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 the, the final stamp on what this is going to sound like but he's not a he's not a one trick guy and which i really appreciated because we used two or three different drums because they had unique sounds and he didn't try to make them sound uh, generic. He said, okay, you know what? You, it sounds like you guys used a, a much deeper 
drum on on this particular tune, like from God Shovel's Feet title track. Um, let's you know, let, let's let's find the character of what that drum is and accent it. Let's really, let's bring it out, or you know, let's bury it. But no drums are buried when it comes to Tom Lord Algae, and so uh, he he really locked into what I was going for, what I what I liked, and he cared about it too. Because when we went in, when we were doing the mix, everybody had told us these crazy stories about Tom Lord Algae, how no one was allowed to be in this in the room with him, and he was difficult to work with, and all that. And he was. A, a gentleman's gentleman. Like I couldn't have asked for a better person to be sitting behind the console with. And he, he would come in and, and he'd work on it and he'd do some stuff. And then he'd look at me and he'd go, like, what do you what do you think? Like, is this is this you? Like that, that was, you know, is this you? Uh he, he wasn't making trying to make it sound, you know, like uh whoever was popular at the time. He's like, is this you? Is this your sound? And yeah, yeah, yeah. I think this is this is really great. But if I didn't like something. He he would say, okay, what what do we need to do? What do we need to do to make this you? Uh, now I think that happened on two cuts. That's about it. And everything else, he just he just locked in. He knows he knows what this should sound like. And we try to replicate it. And I I think that um, I think you said you read our show when we did Blues Fest. Blues Fest, yeah. So so the, two years the, ago, the, the snare that I'm touring with that I've been touring with for the last four years is uh, is a solid brass anniversary. Uh, uh, free floating snare. The thing, the thing, like you could park a truck on it. It's, uh, it's, it's really heavy. Uh, it's solid, but man, it like it, it cracks. And I, I spare no expense. So I take the stick from here down to here, and and when it, when the two meet, uh, you know, there, there's enough pressure there to make a tidal wave. So I have you're you're talking about your drums, how you get that sound. Uh, I have some kind words sent in from one of the rare people that is a platinum drummer also from Winnipeg. So you guys have, there's, there's something here between the two of you. So this is from Sammy Cohn, the drummer from the Watchmen. And uh, he says, I don't know Mitch well, but I've been admiring him for many years and always felt a certain kinship with him, given he too was the drummer in a popular Winnipeg band. Us drummers tend to stick together, no pun intended. There you go. Uh, Mitch may not remember this, but possibly about 25 years ago, him and I met at his home studio just outside of Winnipeg, and he provided me with a lot of encouragement. I contacted him because I was going through a time when I was pretty discouraged about my band, The Watchmen, and what had become of our interpersonal relationships. I don't remember exactly what he said, but I remember him giving me a pep talk that helped me reframe what was important in my life. As a parting gift, for no apparent reason, he also gave me a copy of Brian Eno's diary, A Year with Swollen Appendices, uh, that uh, that I still have, and it indeed provides inspiration today. So happy to see that the dummies are still doing their thing. Mitch and I talk on Facebook from time to time, and I'm glad we're still in touch. Please send him and his bandmates my very best. So that's Sammy from The Watchmen. Uh, you know, again... Uh, so two two things come to my mind from that. Uh, one, Sammy is a, is a wonderful human being, and Sammy and I both have a, a friend in common uh, who's not a musician; he's a squash player. Uh, but he's 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 good friends of of Sammy's and a good friend of mine. And so I, I whenever Sammy's up to something before it hits the news. Uh, he'll kind of he'll he'll fill me in, right? And and he'll kind of say, "Hey, did you did you hear the Watchmen are doing this, or did you hear Sammy's doing this?" Because he sees Sammy and talks to Sammy a lot. And uh, you know, never never a disparaging word uh, from Sammy about anything. Uh, at least in my life, he's always been uh, a, a wonderful. Like I, like I see him, I'm happy to see him. Like uh, like Dan Todd, I see Dan, I'm happy to see him. It's, it's like, whoa, this is great. Can't wait to can't wait to shake the glad hand. Uh, Number two, and you said it with a smile, and I, I don't know that if you're really cued in on this. When you go to a drum clinic and you have, uh, I don't know, let's say, you know, Benny Greb or, or, or uh, yeah, use, use Benny Greb because a lot of drummers would go to see Benny Greb. You'll walk into a room and there'll be 300 drummers and, and uh, they will all uh, talk to each other and no one, no one's hiding from each other. It's like, oh, hey, did you try this? Did you try this drum? Did you do this? Did you do this? Blah, blah, blah. And there's a, there really is a solid kinship 
Uh, and if you went to a guitar clinic, not a lot of guitar players, like, you know, there's a little ego involved with guitar players. You, you can't see it. Yeah. I, it's a, personalities. I don't even know if it's ego. Like, like drummers are a certain breed of people. Bass players are a certain breed of people. And um, Sammy's like 100%. Like drummers tend to hang together. Uh, there's always a camaraderie. There's, there's very rare. Is there, I, I, there's the odd putts. There's always, you know, there's always one, but uh, they're very rare that drummers are dissing each other. They're usually generally kind and forgiving and, and, and saying, Hey, you know, here's, here's something that's new to me. What's new to you kind of a thing. So uh, yeah, uh, kind words from Sammy, uh, you know, uh, Sammy, if you're listening to this, I love you, buddy. So let's, let's talk about the Dumb and Dumber soundtrack. So I was obsessed with Jim Carrey as a kid. So in 1994, that's his big breakout year where he had The Mask, Dumb and Dumber, and one more movie, that's Dumb and Dumber and Ace Ventura, all in the same year where he became the biggest star on the planet. Uh, so Dumb and Dumber, the soundtrack comes out and you guys had the very first song on the soundtrack. Like you can't have better placement than that. So you have the Ballad of Peter Pumpkinhead. I'm going to be honest. I didn't know that that was a cover until right now doing my research. I always associate it with you guys. I didn't know it was an ecstasy cover. So that's cool that I just found that out. Um, top five hit in Canada. It's, I mean, it's, it's such a cult favorite movie. And normally you don't say, you know, a cult fan favorite when it's a movie that made hundreds of millions of dollars. It's one of the greatest and most popular comedy movies of all time, but there's such a cult following. Like people are obsessed with that movie. Uh, what did it mean to you guys to have the song placed in that movie? And and you guys actually recorded, uh, you filmed a music video in Toronto, Nathan Phillips Square, uh, with Jeff Daniels there. Can you talk about kind of the whole experience of the music video, the song placed in the movie, uh, whatever you can give us about that? It's that's exciting, man. As a Jim Carrey fan, yeah. Um, so that one, you have to back up a little bit with that one, um, and just because. There's my head's moving too fast. Um, and I, a name is slipping me right now, but you can give it to me. Uh, star Yellowstone. Um, yeah, Kevin Costner. Kevin Costner. Thank you. Uh, and then, you know, to, uh, no disrespect to Kevin. I just sometimes I you know, look at my own kids and I go, What's your name? Um, <laughs> so we were, we, we were, uh, touring quite extensively and we thought, we should break up the monotony, uh, perceived monotony of the bass baritone on stage. We should get Ellen up singing more stuff. And uh, so, okay, what does Ellen want to sing? And uh, so we, we tossed around some ideas. Dan and Brad are both really big XTC fans and Kiss. I don't know how those two fit together, but <laughs> uh, so they're big XTC fans. And we they used to talk about oranges and lemons all the time. Uh, I think Skylarking was another one that we used to talk about all the time. And um, so uh, Peter Pumpkinhead was, was a tune that was like Ellen said, well, yeah, yeah. Why don't we do Peter Pumpkinhead? That like, that would be fun to do. So, okay, let's put Peter Pumpkinhead in, in, in the show. I think House of Blues in Los Angeles was, I think, the third or fourth show that we played. El Ellen would know better than I would, but um, I think it was like the third or fourth show that we played that Ellen sang Peter Pumpkinhead on. And uh, it was a nice, nice break in the show. And we were looking forward to it. Hey, you know, here we are, nice full house here in, in House of Blues in Los Angeles. Uh, now, I don't know if you know the, the, the building, but the way that it, in Los Angeles, the, the old House of Blues, which is not there anymore. But uh, when it opened up into a club, it was a restaurant. And but when it, it would open up into a club, like the entire second floor would just open. Uh, it was, and, and, there, and all the people that were eating in the restaurant now had balcony seats to the to the show. Uh, it was a very, very, very cool place to play. Well, that particular night, Kevin Costner was there with and I, I can't remember, but the producer for Dumb and Dumber, and uh, and and, and so we, it's the we, uh, the brothers, isn't it? The Farrelly brothers, Farrell brothers. Um, well, it was one particular person that was okay. there with, night, and I can't. I wish I could tell you. I couldn't remember Kevin Costner. How do you expect me to remember? <laughs> so, um, after the show, they they came down and and they wanted to meet with us and stuff like that. And uh, he said, "Hey, I really like that." 
you know, that uh, Peter Pumpkin heads, you know, I'm, I'm making this movie. It's uh, called Dumb and Dumber. And, and I, I think this would be like a, a, a really good addition to the, to the film. Have, have you guys recorded it? And it was, well, no, we just, it's like, it's an XTC song and we've just put it into the repertoire for Ellen to sing. So he said, well, if you guys would be willing to record that, I'd love to put it in, in, into my movie. And uh, we thought about it for about four seconds and uh, went, came back to Winnipeg. And uh, at that point in time, Brad was living on Jesse, had a studio called God of Thunder. And we went into the studio and man, we, we, we ripped that off in, in, a, in a couple of days. Uh, we had this really small little drum booth. And I remember being cramped in there, but you know, I had to kick the shit out of the drums and it was, it was, it was really good times, lots of energy. And to take it over the top, uh, we brought Tom Lord Algae in to mix it. And so it was mixed in Brad's little studio. So it wasn't mixed in some big place. And then, so we, we handed it in and he said, yeah, this is, this is really great. This is fantastic. This is wonderful. So off we go. Uh, we, we hand him the song and now because the movie's coming out and it's in the, and the movie's getting lots of publicity. Uh, the song is genuinely a great song. So we said, well, let's, let's do the video for it. Um, I can't remember the circumstances that led because Jim Carrey was unavailable. We were hoping to have both Jim and Jeff. And, uh, uh, but it, I, Jim had some other thing that he had to honor. I can't quite remember, but Jeff was available. And, and, and he, he was like, yeah, sure. Let's, let's do it. And it was like, well, you know, like it's a music video. We don't have like a, a budget that you would pr probably command. And I, I like just a, the wonderful human being that Jeff Daniels is was like, well, this is, this is about doing something fun. So let's do this and let it, let's let it be fun. And, and, you know, the, the, the whole wearing the pumpkin thing. And he was an absolute gem uh, to, to work with. And he, and he brought just a, a great energy and the, the, there was stuff like we worked him to, to the bone. Cause he, I mean, we had, I think we had him for three days and I, and I think we said, well, how many hours are there in three days? Okay. There's 36, blah, 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 blah. Uh, you know, carry the one and we used them every minute uh, and he never complained. Uh, and he, you know, he'd come and he'd, he was, he was eating with us. And uh, we said, okay, you know, this happened, this happens, kind of like you were saying, we can do some editing on the fly. There was a few other things that happened. We said, okay, well, can we do this instead? And he just, yeah, sure. Yeah, let's do it. Let's, let's go out and do it. And, and uh, um, I think he showed up a couple of times to a couple of shows that we did after that, uh, just to shake the hands. I don't know if he was actually came to the show or just came in to shake hands and, and, and say, thanks guys. It was good fun. Um, but it was just, a, a, a again, more often than not, you hear horror stories about people being prima donnas and everything else, but we just never had that. You know, he was, he was fabulous. The, the whole process of recording the song for the, you know, the, and the way that it came about was just a bunch of nice people saying, Hey, this, this seems like a really good idea. Let's put our forces together and make it happen. And again, that snare sound on that song is incredible. And I, it sounds like it's a mix of you, the drums and having uh, Tom Lord Al uh, doing the mixing. I mean, that's, that seems like the, the formula to that insane snap of a snare. Yeah, yeah, he like he likes to. Uh, I mean, you want to get technical geek stuff, you know. He likes to take drums. He loves compressing the drums, and and he and he he works really hard. He mixes at an insane level. Uh, so, you know, he says he likes to make everything work to stand out of the mix, as opposed to making a mix and have everything stand out. He likes to make it work to stand out. And and I think that that's where you know he understands the balance of of doing that now. The fact that he loves drums is is another thing, right? Because he likes to hear it. He wants he likes putting his stamp on it. So Dumb and Dumber was directed by the Farrelly brothers with Troy Miller. Is that who you're thinking of? Troy Miller or was someone else? Yeah, I you know, I'd be guessing. I'm, I'm right. not gonna I'm not I'm not gonna I'm not gonna try to pull the shades over your eyes. We we have more important things to get to, and there's nothing more important than the kind words sent in from the following person who who really shines in that song. So this is from Ellen Reed. I got a quote here from the great and powerful Ellen Reed. Uh, she says, where to begin with the amazingness that is the Dorge? Consistently positive, 
sensible, silly, smart, and talented. He is always looking for different ways of looking at things, finding a fresh take on what others would have ignored. He is the best of us, and without him, touring would be boring. He brightens my day on the regular, and she leaves you with this. His farts smell like a weak, overdue folk festival porta potty. Kind words from Ellen. That is, uh, that is the, that's, yeah, you got to love Ellen. And I do love her dearly. And the fact that she would say something kind about me is, is, uh, again, I, little, little tear right about here somewhere. Uh, you know, Ellen is, uh, in a lot of cases, she's my savior. Uh, when, when we're on the road, we, we can, we can just drop the road life and be silly and have a good time and we can tear each other up and we do uh, we can tear each other up and, and no one gets offended no one gets right it's all done in, with good humor and 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 good fun uh i would point that right back at her uh she i i very rare do you meet someone as intelligent uh as what ellen brings to the table and she's never one to sit there and take the glory Unless, of course, there's money attached to it, then, you know, this is, she always wants, you know, that extra loony. Throw that extra loony in there at her. But, yeah, I'm not going to get into cutting her up because that's that's something that we save for each other on the road. So even though this is a two-hour deep dive interview, two hours sounds like a lot of time. Uh, we're, we're going into the final 20 minutes or so, and there's still seven Crash Test Dummies albums. There's your solo album. There's your your uh, inspirational speaking. There's so much stuff to talk about. So I'm just going to blast through a few things from a few more albums. And then uh, there's some other things we can look at. Uh, so you guys release A Worm's Life in 1996, three more singles, top 20 album. The album goes platinum in Canada, sells over a million copies worldwide. So the success continues. Uh, it was recorded in the Bahamas in the winter of 1995 uh is there any better place to be to record an album than in the bahamas in the winter you got to get out of the winnipeg winters correct yeah there there was more to that uh like being in the bahamas first of all we were recording that with uh, terry manning was the engineer on that album terry uh, was instrumental in a lot of uh, albums like you know he worked with led zeppelin and and so we we thought okay here's someone who's going to bring something really different to the table um uh, luckily we you know through through the way that things work in the world that studio uh, became available to us and um we were staying so b behind the studio um tina as uh, um, what's tina's last name from the talking heads um is it tina waymouth um and and uh, so they they're condos were behind the studio and uh, so we we stayed there for a little while it was it was just kind of it was just kind of a neat place to be because wow we're staying in the same I, i'm staying in a house that belongs to a member of the talking heads and uh and then across the studio across the street uh robert palmer's house was there and uh, and i stayed in robert palmer's house and it was it was it was phenomenal. I was just you know wow, this is Robert Palmer's house. It, it, you know it, it had a TV and a couch and a kitchenette like every other house, but still Robert Palmer lived there, and it was it was a very very cool thing. And um, while we were doing that, and, and the reason I'm I'm bringing this up is that in Studio B, uh, Jimmy Buffett was was recording uh, an album over there. Now of course you know just as as of recently, and so uh, Jimmy Buffett's engineer who has recorded most of his albums is a guy by the name of Rob Eaton, Robert Eaton. And, uh, and I, I was like, wow, this is really cool that, you know, you've worked with him for this long. And, and so we were working back to back. And then I find out that Rob is also the front of house guy and has been a studio guy for Pat Metheny for the last 25 years. Now I'm a huge Pat Metheny fan. And, and uh, so that conversation 
leads to us playing in New York. And Pat was recording in Right Track Studios at the time. And Rob called me up and said, hey, Pat's in the studio. Do you want to come and, and, and hang out in the studio with us for the day? Is like, are you kidding? So, you know, off I go and here I am in Right Track Studios and I've and I've and I'm, I'm sitting on a piano bunch with Lyle Mays, which to me is is does life get better than this? And you know, Pat's going over the music and everything else. Um, I tr all that stuff I attribute back to uh, the recording of, of of Worm's Life. Uh, it was a wonderful little studio, had a wonderful vibe. Uh, the the availability because we're in the Bahamas. Uh, availability of of equipment sometimes was uh, weird because uh, we needed guitars and we needed basses and all this kind of stuff that beyond our own that we just wanted to try just for different flavors and stuff like that. And um, the 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 process of what we were trying to do. Uh, one song on that album, which is a, you know if you're going to call it a deep cut, is a tune called "Driver's Gestures," which is one of the tunes on the album and it's not to take anything away from anything else on the album but for me it's one of those tunes on the album where we just nailed it it's the every time i listen to that i it just feels like we couldn't we couldn't have played that any better than than, than what it was and for for me as mentioned earlier when we're on stage and we have that moment where like it's not going to get better than this this is this is fantastic. That's an amazing feeling. So uh, that particular one, and of course, at that particular time, our A and R guy was shifting. So David Abendeth had left to go to I think Sony Records in the U.S. And uh, we had a new fella, and his name slips me right now, uh, but he was on the phone with us, you know, every day. And uh, and also keep in mind that for God shovel his feet and for a Worm's Life, um, my role was not merely as drummer. Um, I, you know, we, I co-produced both those albums. Uh, so, I, you know, keyboard things, guitar things, uh, you know, programming sounds, yeah, programming soundscapes, um, we're, we're very in, integral. Um, if I, I'm just going to veer off just for a second, just so, um, when we started working on God Shovel This Feet, there's a tune in there called Two Nights and Maidens and, uh, Two Nights and Maidens is, so when we started talking about Two Nights and Maidens, you know, I sat down at the risk of everybody hammering me, and uh, and I, I said, "Okay, this is this is how I see this song, right?" And, and you know, like we're in a desert, and off in the desert, there's this big, there's a there's a castle, and uh, and and so we're we're on like a drone or we're on in a glider at that point in time, and uh, you know, and and as the glider approaches the castle, there's it, it swells, and when we fly over the castle and we see there's people in the castle, that's when the first chord comes in, and 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 the first you know. And, uh, first uh, verse starts off and then the glider takes off out of it and it comes round and then we, when we come in so every time we go to a verse or a course it gets bigger and bigger and bigger but it's because this this glider is coming in and uh, you know and what do I perceive the landscape as being for me all of those songs are all they're all visual uh, everything that I everything that I've contributed uh, to, to crash test dummies apart from apart from drums is 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 visual is is what it does to my visual landscape of how all these songs work and uh when we got into doing a worm's life um that the the that song that album wasn't as visual as the other albums were they were more uh more groove groove oriented uh you know like sitting sitting in the pocket and less creating the the soundscape uh but the place that we were in which was really hot um and really cool beaches and palm trees everywhere uh, really contributed to our mindset in terms of how we approach the music every day i know you want to move on so i'll just stop there and I'll just keep no going. man I'm, I'm soaking in everything i can get about the uh, crash test dummies history and and the albums uh, we have a fan question uh, this is from zach dufresne his question is what are your favorite crash test dummies songs uh, so I don't know if you can spitfire three three to five favorite songs. I don't know. Okay, so for, first of all, I'm going to answer that in two parts. Number one, uh, and I said this earlier and I'll say it again, every song that we play every night, I approach like it's the best song ever. And it's like the first time that we're going to play it. Because even though maybe it's my 2000th time playing this tune, I know that for our audience, it's their first. 
And, and uh, so I want it to be as fresh and amazing as, as always. So the, you know, the generic answer to that would be every one of them is my favorite. However, there are songs that I really, really enjoy playing. Um, but it's mostly because of the interaction between the band members. So as an example, how does a duck know? Uh, every night, Ellen comes over and and uh, she she hits the drums with me every night. And she just, she just, I, I so look forward to that moment where she, she turns around and she starts walking towards the drums. I, like I absolutely, I just dig it. It's just like, oh, this is going to be fun, right? She's going to nail it and it's going to be fun. Um, amity, amity, amity. Uh, quite often we finish the night with that. And Brad will come over and, and, and he likes kicking the snot out of this big China type symbol I have right behind me. And, but he enjoys it. And every night when we get to that point and, and I see him turn around, he starts walking towards the drum kit. He's excited. Like he's, he wants to get there because he wants to hit that symbol. Uh, it's fantastic. Um, every night when we play, uh, um, he liked to feel it. Uh, that's a tune where everybody gets to shine. Uh, and and uh, but we have Leith Fleming Smith, who's our keyboard player, who he really shines in that night. And because he's got a guitar that he runs out and he plays with, and the audience loses their mind because uh, he because it sits beside him the whole night. And you can kind of see people going, "Is he going to play that thing or like what's going on?" And when he picks it up and he goes out there, the people lose their minds, and he plays it like the consummate professional that he is. Uh, and again, the energy that gets created is is so much fun. Uh, when we do afternoons and coffee spoons, it's a favorite to a lot of people, but it's also a tune that we're able to break down. And, and Stuart has, uh, has has his moment where he gets to be he just gets to be Stuart Cameron. And uh, again, it, it, it adds a, such a dynamic to the to the show uh, that it, I, again, every night I just look forward to to that moment where I see him get out there. And then uh, there's God shoveled his feet. Uh, again, I love, I love playing the tune, but the highlight for me is that uh, being that you listen to the bass, there's a little, the, the bass run at the end of song, right? That little thing that Dan does at the end of the night. Well, some nights Dan's hands hurt and, and, uh, and sometimes they don't. And uh, I know, so I, I, every night when we get to that part, I'm listening to see like, okay, is he going to really tackle it tonight? Is he going to really nail it? And, uh, you know, 99.9% .9 of the time he nails it. And, and, uh, but I look at him when he's doing it and he's just, he's just so in that moment, right. I, I'm going to nail this sucker. And even though my hand hurts, cause he's got a problem with his wrist. So, you know, even though my hand hurts, I'm going to nail the sucker. Uh, so uh, there's four songs that every night, um, I really look forward to, to, to playing, uh, just because of, 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 you know what's happening on stage the newest one of course uh sacred alphabet which is again it, it's it's a ballad uh it's offbeat it's not what anybody would expect uh but that tune um has a lot of power to it and uh and i i enjoy playing that one uh, a lot because it's 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 kind of a left turn from what we would normally do but it has a lot of power to it and when we nail it I, I I can see the the, the audience like our, our front of house guy Wayne, uh, he says like really lay into those floor toms and I lay into them and 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 I you see the people out there and it goes boom and like they just there's this whole thing where the uh, you know in the Matrix uh, where they touch and it's, everything goes woo, 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 uh, that kind of a thing so those are all really fun songs that, that I enjoy playing uh, not so much because of the of the the songs themselves as much as the interaction between us or the way that the crowd responds to them so in in 1999 you guys released the album give yourself a hand uh, i wanted to bring this up because this has a special place in my heart so in 1999 i was 14 and there's three singles it's a top 15 album but the lead single uh keep a lid on things so this was a massive top 10 hit in canada and I was obsessed with this at 14. Anytime it came on the radio, I would crank it up. I'd be waiting for it to play on the radio. This is long before like the digital, you know, stuff and, and the uh, downloading and and uh, iTunes and all that stuff. So I'd wait for it on radio. And I, I had this album as well. And I just I'd never heard anything like it before. Was was there a fear 
releasing a song that was so different than everything else. So this is even from a band that was known for being different. Uh, this song was just very unique. Well, it was a bit of an evolution there because Greg Wells worked on that album. And, uh, and, and Greg Wells brought a lot of Greg Wells to, to, to the album. And, and I, and I think the good thing about that was that uh, he was able to take the band and, and kind of move us a little bit more left uh, rather than creating another album that sounds like all the other albums. And, and, and if you look at, if, if you look at the first four albums in particular, they're very different records all the way through. And uh, so, you know, Greg brought um, a sense like the, the, the whole loop thing that happens in, in there. And, and then that sort of like that groovy backbeat. Uh, he, he brought that essence to the, to, to the way things felt. And um, I think he pushed Brad in a, in a bit of a different direction rather than just, you know, it's not just about the bass baritone, but he all of a sudden he, he gave Brad like a lot of attitude in particular that song, right. Uh, keep a lid on things. Like he, he really, brought a lot of attitude to it. Uh, whereas, you know, the others might've been a little bit more about melody. Uh, that album in general was more about attitude and, and what he brought to it. So um, I think I, I was a little worried at the time for the mere fact that that was a direction that a lot of bands were going in, like just that, that sort of the, the, the loopy kind of feel. And I was worried that we might be perceived as jumping on the bandwagon. Uh, but I think Greg brought so much more to it that we, we got, we got away from that. It, cause it, it, you know, and maybe a combination between what, what Greg brought and the attitude that Brad was having. Right. So for a lot of crash, the dummy fans, it was like, Ooh, okay, well, this is, this is Brad on sizzle. Right. As opposed to, you know, Brad and the opera. Now we got Brad on sizzle here. And then, and we got the band, really focusing in on a on a like a swingy loopy groove as opposed to sort of a, a pop rock sensibility um I, I think we didn't it didn't sound like bandwagoning at the time you know what three months later though maybe maybe we because every band went in that direction at that time so we were like maybe right the time the timing was good and and we were able to save it a little bit i think um, but I, again, you know, Greg just brought something so special to that record. So the times described the album as the best music of their career, an album of rare wit and vitality. So after that, you guys, I'm, I'm going to have to fast track through this. So, uh, after that, you guys went on to release five more albums between 2001 and 2010. You released 13 more singles, uh, including the newest one, Sacred Alphabet, that was just a few months ago. So my question is, between all the touring you guys have been doing lately with an upcoming tour and with the new single release a few months ago, is there any chance of a new album or are there any plans for a new album? Uh, you don't have to give away any secrets, but as a fan, I have to ask on behalf of the, the, the people. At this particular point in time, looking at making an album is a very expensive venture for something that people aren't buying. True. Um, and, and, and so, um, if Taylor Swift does something and, and, and I'm this, I'm only using Taylor Swift because she's got cachet. Uh, so, and I, I, am not sure if she's signed to Sony or, which, but she's got a record company behind her and, and she's making enough money that it's, it's, it, it's a good thing to do. Um, the record company will assume some of the expense of, of, of producing the record. They'll assume some of the expense of the touring, uh, the promotion, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But right now we're touring and, and I'm quite surprised at the amount of CDs that we're selling, but I mean, any, anybody under the age of 30, uh, not interested. They're, they're just, they're, they're, they're coasters. CDs are coasters. Uh, now vinyl is making a bit of a comeback. So some people are buying vinyl, but a lot of people are just going to Spotify and mostly and, streaming. Yeah. Yeah. Mostly streaming. So to, to, to take on the expense of making another record to have, wait, wh wh what are we, what are we going to sell? Um, people aren't really buying, you know, like in terms of a new crowd, 
they're not really buying CDs. Uh, vinyl is, it seems to be something that's going to collectors. So what what, what is it exactly we're going to sell? And, and if we don't have a solid um, uh, item, I guess you'd say of merchandise, uh, it, it kind of makes it hard to to justify, you know, the the cost, the the, the promotion, the production, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now, I'm not going to say no, that 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 won't happen, but I'm saying that those kinds of things seem to be kind of stacked up um, against us right now. Now, combine that with when we do shows, um, people really do want to hear the hits that they remember, right? Our, our crowd, it's, you can't get away from it. If you go see Honeymoon Suite, there's going to be a certain demographic out there that are going to want to hear the hits of yesteryear. Same with Lover Boy, same with Streetheart, right? If Streetheart went out and didn't play action, people would feel that they got ripped off, right? Um, so uh, to go out and, and you know, I went to see James Taylor once in Newfoundland and uh it was a three hour show. It was an amazing thing. I love James Taylor. So it, I was, I was in heaven for most of the night. And when it came to the halftime, uh, he, he didn't go off the stage. He went into the front of the stage. He sat down, he signed stuff. He talked to people. It was, it was lovely. About four songs into the second half of the show, he said, he stopped everything. And he said, ladies and gentlemen, we were sitting around the living room the other day and we wrote a new song. Uh, we think it's kind of a good song. So uh, we, we're going we're gonna to slip it into the set. Now, I'm, I'm apologizing now because you haven't heard this before. But we like it. We think it's worthwhile putting in. And once we do that, we'll get back to the hits, right? Uh, and, and, of course, everybody loved it. But that was it. The rest of the night was all hits of yesteryear, right? And, and that's what the people were there for. So we also have that to contend with. Uh, you know, do we do we go out and try to you know, say, here's, here's a new song we wrote uh, without giving them sufficient amount of, of, of what they came for, in which case, how long does the show get? Right. And, and, and uh, you know, it's very often, sometimes we will try to put a new song in, in the show. And then when you get to that new song, which people might not know, eh, there seems to be an awful lot of people going to the lobby to get a beer. Uh, you know what I mean? So, um, do you want to take that expense when you haven't got record companies behind you and, and all that kind of stuff? Is it is it just better to to go out there, give them what they want, and 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 sprinkle pepper it with something new and and invigorating, right? And it, it's been um, we do Heart of Stone, which is uh, a, a just a, a work of art that Brad's come up with, and um, it touches people. In their, in their hearts and 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 it makes people cry because it's it's that good of a song and so pulling that out in the show is a is a is an amazing thing sacred alphabet which is a new song which we can say because everybody asks the same question you're going to write new songs so it's a, it's a new tune but it doesn't follow any of the conventions of 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 pop music right so uh we're getting a feel how's that going to go over if we come up with something else and it goes over well well once you got five or six of those eh, then you think start thinking about you know albums yeah most likely it would be just some singles and maybe an ep more so than than an upcoming yeah. album uh, yeah. so so you guys have a tour coming up so the jingle all the way tour this is november and december there's dates in canada there's dates in the u.s uh what what can people expect when they go out to see you guys on that tour. This is a uh, Christmas themed. It's named after a Christmas album that you guys put out. What can people expect? Are you going to get them in the mood for the holidays here? Well, I, I think so. Um, I, you know, we're crash system is not a real, uh, Christmas band. Uh, you know, the bare naked ladies down there's a Christmas band. They can go out there and they can have all kinds of fun with it. And, and, uh, uh, there's lots of shenanigans on stage and stuff like that. Whereas Crash Test Dummies is not necessarily a, a, a shenanigan band. Um, but we do definitely have our, our spin on, on the, on the Christmas songs. And uh, so we are going to go out, we're going to take out maybe the lesser known songs and replace them with some of the Christmas tunes. Uh, a lot of them from uh, the, the Christmas album. Uh, but but I but I don't think we're going to beat people over the head with it. I think we're going to try and, and keep it light, and uh, and you know 
uh, the, with the Christmas spirit or the holiday spirit or however people want to. It's so difficult to, to label that stuff these days. So, but it will be fun. I will guarantee you that it will be fun uh, because the the last tour that we did uh, with Leith and and Stuart uh, having them shine. Uh, everyone else on stage is having such a good time. Uh, now sprinkling in the Christmas tunes, right? Because there's like a little that little bit of purpose kind of thing. I, I'm I'm really looking forward to 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 getting out there and just seeing the reaction uh, of of people coming out and seeing this lineup, but playing you know the, the songs of the season. We have two questions sent in from fans that have to do with touring. So Brenda Adamson. Her question is, I heard you're still in your undies 10 minutes before stage time. Is this true? And then Rebecca Gilbert asks, what have been your favorite places to perform on this recent never ending tour? Uh, so in general, yes, to the first question. Um, it's it's a running, it's kind of a running gag that we that we have that Wayne will come back before the show and uh, like Mitch, Mitch, what? What you're not ready? What's going on? And and uh, and I, I I quite often purposely just I hold off until he comes back and yells at me. Um, you're having it, a no pants party back there. Uh, yeah, it's it's we've become a kind of a, a bit of a running gag. Um, I try to not do it when we're under pressure because sometimes we're in places and things aren't going as they should, and you're so we're under pressure. Wayne doesn't need that extra pressure. He doesn't, you know, he needs to know that I'm ready. And, uh, but I do. Yeah. I I'm that guy. I'm the guy that he's yelling at, uh, to 10 minutes before the show. Guy, Come on. Uh, so yes. Uh, Brenda, is that was it? Brenda Adam, Adamson asked that one. Uh, oh, so, I forget it's back. Yeah. Brenda and uh, Rebecca are the two. Okay. So, so Brenda, Brenda heard correctly. And, uh, the most fun places, uh, I really, I, I, I can't give you specifics, but I really like the um, old, uh, some of the places we've been playing have been converted uh, churches and uh, and some of the old, old theaters that we get into. Um, now, if you've followed me on Facebook, you you know that I'm I'm photo guy. And so I, I crawl into the bowels of these places and, and, uh, and I, I catch just the weirdest things that happens in these places. But they've all got an amazing vibe. Uh, now, now it's not to say that I don't like the vibe of the, you know, the upscale theaters, but there's like there's a there's a history, and and you generally in the dressing room there's there's forty posters of all the artists that have that have played here, um, many of them in their early years, right when they were coming up, and and uh, so the the history that these places have are just so much fun to. to to, to to grab into and then i find like the old projection booths and you know that haven't been used in 30 years and it's cobwebs everywhere and, and it's like for for a photo guy that's like that's a that's a heaven thing um so yeah i would say i can't say any one place specific but i can say the kind of places that we're playing have been pretty awesome so as we wrap up, is there anything you want to share with our listeners about either your award-winning solo album, about your love of squash, about uh, taking your dog out for amazing walks at, I don't know, 4 a.m. or 5 a.m.? There's a lot of pictures of those. Uh, you as a photographer, you you seem to know how to properly capture your dog in its essence. Uh, anything you want to say about Vicky Vale, about your, your inspirational speaking? So there's about five things. Is there anything in there that you'd like to touch on as we wrap up? Um, I, I can touch on a couple of them. Uh, one, the Vicky Vale project is, um, as you know, if you've looked at my website, uh, the Vicky Vale thing is, is started off, uh, as with it's, it's, it's sort of like, it's the Harry Parch of, of music. So Harry Parch, you, you created all these instruments that were like weird, wacky bottles and, and instruments with strings. And, and, uh, so there's, there's a core of people that um, I got approached to do a, a series called Medicine Line, a television series. And the music was uh, to be um, outside. We wanted it to be experimental. And so I pulled a couple of guys together um, that we can all sit in the studio and I can we can we can play something and we can each look at each other and say, you know what, that's quite possibly the worst thing you've ever done. 
so let's try that again. But let's time let let's do it backwards, and um, and I'm going to cut your E string off of your guitar, and and then and then so we we work with absurd uh, situations, and but we create some really really cool uh, what I'm going to call new music. And uh, it's something that, uh, which is away from the dummies. It's not a pop thing. It's not about selling records. It's about creating a space. And uh, since since that series, um, I've got about probably six or seven other television series that we've done the music for. Um, now a lot of it is under is under my flag, and a lot of it is the music is done by me. But probably 30, 40 percent of it is got the Vicky Vale stamp on it. And uh, I, I'm looking forward to a time when we can get out and just do new music festivals. Uh, so it'd be a different crowd. It's not about pop music. It's just about uh, that thing, which is really apart from drums is what I bring to crash test dummies is I bring, I, I, I bring that other side, the experimental side, the side that says no bars, you know, no bars held where Ellen might look at me and go, Mitch, what are you thinking? Uh, but a lot of that stuff makes it in and it makes it interesting, which is why I really like the, the Vicky Vale project. I, we are going to uh, release uh, probably about 20 or 25 songs that we've, that we've done, not for the faint of heart. Uh, some of it's a real left turn. I said, I'd send you some and I will when I, when I find it. Um, the, the squash thing that I mentioned um, when you're on the road, and your road life can can be really hard. I think anybody that's ever you've ever interviewed has probably said that. And oh, oh woe is me! You're doing what you love doing. Uh, but when you're traveling, you get into a position where, oh, I'm you know, what are we going to do? We've got two hours. Well, there's a shopping mall across the street, or there's a bookstore over there, or there's a bar we can hang out into. And so my other thing, I, if I if I wasn't a drummer, I probably would have been a squash player. Uh, absolutely love the game. Um, I you know I played I played an exhibition match with one of the top world top players in the atrium between the twin towers uh, about three weeks before the twin towers came down. Um, I've uh, I was in Los Angeles and a friend of mine called me up and said, now I don't know if you where your musical um, stylings go, but Billy Cobham at one point in time would have been somebody that every drummer would have, would have, you know, dragged their ass through shards of glass to meet. And so a buddy of mine calls me up and says, Hey, Billy Cobham's in town and we're, we're playing some squash this afternoon. Do you want to come down? It's like, absolutely. And, and that started a friendship between me and Billy Cobham uh, for years. Uh, we would see each other in different cities and we would get out and we would play and, and, and it was something that took me away from music on the road and uh, kept me fit and uh, introduced me to a whole different group of people uh, that would often, oh, let's go, I'm going to come out to one of your shows. We didn't, you know, you're part of Crash Test Dummies. We didn't know that. Um, but it opened so many doors uh, and, and, and kept me away from hanging out in bookstores and shopping malls and uh, just, just a, a wonderful thing. And I'd say anybody who's watching this that wants to get into the touring life and uh, has aspirations, uh, whatever your hobby is, take it with you and, and, and explore it when you're out there so that you don't get into the hanging out of bars late at night. And I, and I don't mean that as, as a, you know, PSA, uh, because it, it gets you down after a while because it's routine and you think that's your only option. But when you have something, you know, uh, Ellen, for instance, uh, she's a cross stitcher. And, and so a lot of times to get away from the monotony of, of, you know, venue, sound check, eating, uh, hanging out for an hour, show back to the hotel, up, uh, breakfast somewhere, shopping mall, like uh, that kind of a thing. You'll find Ellen cross stitching all the time, and it, it's it just saves you, right? So squash has been that for me. Um, can't remember the other things that you mentioned. Um, the uh, the solo album. The solo album was was a, was a was a was a great thing. I loved doing it. I still I listen to it periodically, but once a year. And uh, and I and I listen back to it, and I don't have any regrets. I'm happy with with how that turned out. Um, 
winning winning the the award for it was uh, a definite surprise i because it's not a commercial album it's it's anything else so they i think they they labeled it um, new age i think maybe um outstanding instrumental recording oh okay but i think it was still i think it was labeled In a category okay i think it was labeled as new age uh and so i think there were like five other contenders in there uh, the fact that you know with that kind of music it's not pop music so it's not based on record sales so somebody listened to it and liked it uh so that, i took that as a as a real compliment i look forward to doing something like that again uh it's it's nice to be doing something there's no drums on that record right so uh to 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 be able to express myself musically and, and not just as a drummer is is kind of a nice thing uh to, to be able to do the the equivalent of you playing squash while out on tour i see a lot of metal bands that uh they practice jujitsu while out on tour so tool trivium five finger death punch they all find they either take like their jujitsu instructor on tour with them and they have like mats that follow them and or they they go into different schools in different cities but uh jujitsu is kind of the thing in the metal world that all the people seem to be doing to keep their sanity while on tour, stay fit, uh, work towards mastery and something else. So I guess that's the equivalent of, of squash then. Yeah. And, and the good thing about that is it breaks the mindset, right? Just uh, going somewhere else and doing something else, which has absolutely nothing to do with what it is that you do. When you get back on that stage, your mind is a little bit more clear. You're a little bit more focused uh, it, it's, it's a wonderful thing to, to explore. I, you know, for years, I, I mean, I've always had this. So I, I, you know, back in the days of God shoveled his feet, my games were all, uh, cause we were, you know, we toured for 18 months, uh, which is a long time to be in a tour bus. Uh, but I would be, I, I had a game booked every like two cities ahead. Right. So I, I, I knew that when we got off the plane or we got off the bus, that I'd have to be at the club at this time and we'd play and I'd get back and I would be recharged. It'd be all fresh, ready to go. Uh, and if, you know, if we had a jujitsu guy with us, uh, just, it just takes you out of, out of, you know, the, your, your, your focal point. So we have one final fan question. This is from Joel Walther. Uh, he wants you to rapid fire through the music that you're listening to now. Right now, uh, believe it or not, uh, uh, the downward spiral, nine inch nails, as is masterpiece. Is, yeah, it just it's it's there. Um, I would say uh, right now I'm listening to uh, a lot of Tchaikovsky, Chopin. I've I've got Brian Eno uh, uh, going through constantly, uh, but the one that keeps coming up, uh, if I was in rapid fire is a downward spiral it's like i can't i can't not listen to it uh, that mm, i got two other out, out records that are in in that loop and that is king crimson uh so i think i think beat is the one that i've got going in there constantly right now and believe it or not uh i to this day i don't like what the white album uh, from the beatles is still is still i listen to it and it makes me smile every time those are all all time great albums. Uh, just a few deep questions to to round this up here. So I know expressing gratitude is important to you. So when you look back on your life and career, what are you most proud of? And what are you most grateful for? I'm grateful for the connections. And I and I and I, I acknowledge that as often as I can. If I um, <clears throat> I had it's just an example of what I mean by the connections. There's another drummer. I used to teach at a place called Major Minor Music. When I quit teaching there because I wanted to go on the road, I went to Europe. Another fellow took over by the name of David Schneider. Now, David Schneider uh, really liked what I did as a drummer. He supported me as a drummer. And, and so over the years, we became friends. When we With that friendship, we opened up a place. We rented a house that we called the Jam Sandwich. In that Jam Sandwich... What we did is we had anybody who wanted to play an instrument that didn't have a place to play or didn't have an instrument for $10 a month, uh, you could come to this place that we had. And if you didn't have a guitar, we had we rented guitars that you could use or uh, drums or whatever, and you could take a room, you could play for an hour. In one, one of the people that came to, to the jam sandwich on a, on a regular basis was a guy by the name of Curtis Riddell. Curtis Riddell would come to me 
uh, at the end of the say at the, at the at, uh, after his practice time, and he would say, you know what, I want to. I got this idea. I want to open up a place called the Blue Note, and uh, it's going to be a late night coffee place, and it's going to be uh, you know blah blah blah. And I used to think, oh, okay, he's another guy that wants to who's got a dream. Well, wouldn't you know it, he ends up opening the Blue Note, and the Blue Note becomes a place where all the musicians hang out, which is where I meet Dan Roberts and Brad Roberts and Ellen Reed, and uh, and so. Uh, now, so that place is happening there. Now, Curtis's brother, Mark Riddell, opens up a club a block over called the Spectrum, which is where the black, uh, crash test dummies are quite known for performing at was at the Spectrum. Uh, so I, so, you know, these guys provided a place for us to meet and play and, 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 and do things. Now, uh, that's just one little trail. But I, I look back at it all the time and I, and I go back and I go, wow, like my buddy, David Schneider, who, who supported me as, you know, as a drummer, he was proud that I was made it in crash test dummies and wanted to do all that. And that the fact that we took that friendship and took it to the next level and that all this, all these people come into your lives and they all, they all play a, a, a part. And if you look back, um, you know, my 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 love of jazz probably came from my buddy John Zylak, who I mentioned earlier, who introduced me to Miles Davis. Um, you know, there's there's a number of shifts of sound men, of people. Uh, you know, Jacques Lussier bringing me to 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 Europe and all the doors that they opened. And I I, I stop and I say thank you to to all those people that created those circumstances, which have led me to you know to what I am today. Uh, they all played a part in it. And I think it's important that we all acknowledge uh, the, the many people who have come across our paths. Uh, so when I talk about gratitude, uh, that's what I mean, uh, because none of us, none of us are self-made. Uh, the, there's somebody somewhere that pointed us in a direction, said something, did something uh, that introduced us to a, a, a new way of, of doing things. Uh, so many people you can hear that audition for bands or get into bands a lot of times it's because they were recommended from, you know, someone else. And sometimes they weren't even musicians. They go, you know, when I, when I think of the first real band I played with is because I was standing at the counter of major minor music and a guitar player came in who said, uh, do you know any drummers looking for work? And a friend of mine, who's not a, not a musician at all. His name was Brent Ross. He was standing right there and he said, this guy right here is my friend. His name is Mitch, and he's an excellent drummer. You should hire him in your band. And he said, "Okay, uh, do you want to come for an audition?" You know what I mean? And 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 that led to some other guys that I was playing with, which led to Fantasy Express. Uh, you know what I mean? And all, all these things of growth. And and I think we need to take the time just to to acknowledge where we've come from, and and realize that no matter how big we think we are or how much we think we know, there's a whole lot of people that pave that way for us. Final question. If you could go back in time and you could sit down next to your 10 year old self and you could whisper words of advice in cute little Mitch's ear. So you've had all that time since then where you you've had lessons and mentorship and and ups and downs, life lessons. What words do you whisper in Mitch's ear to help him navigate this human experience? Give it your all. Um, don't, don't hang back. Don't wait for it to happen. Uh, take, take opportunities and seize them. I'm not saying I wouldn't tell my 10 year old self to put everything on hold and, 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 uh, get, you know, um, put your whole life into it, but seize opportunities when they, when they, when they come, uh, so many things that I wish I would have done and didn't it just, just because, you know, I'm not going to say that I, I don't have regrets, um, but I think if I would have pushed, a, a, taken more of the opportunities that were provided for me, walked through more of the doors that were open for me, uh, that I would be um, maybe in a position to express myself better than I can now. Is there anything you'd like to say to the fans that have been supporting you all the way back to say 1991 any words for the fans as we leave here uh yeah straight up i can't thank you enough when we go out and we play and those fans come over and they're polite and they're kind and they say 
you know, your music, or in some cases, I, I, I meet some people that I've sp spoken to uh, about drumming and drum camps and stuff like that. And they say that, you know, th what you've offered, you know, changed my life. I, I take that with a grain of salt, but still, um, and, and, and they come and they support us. Uh, fans, I don't think, realize how important that is. Uh, when we get their support, when they show up to a show and they're enthusiastic and, you know, because really, I mean, we're artists, we're expressing ourselves. I don't want to get all earnest on you, but we are expressing ourselves. We're, I mean, come on, I take two pieces of wood and I hit metal and plastic and I, and I sweat a lot every night and somebody pays me for it. And the reason that that happens is because the fans come out to our shows. I get to do what I love doing every day because these people are giving of their time and, and, and their money, you know, for, for a show. It's, it's not like they're throwing money at us, but you know what I mean? They still have to go out and they have to buy those tickets and they come and they, and they, they, they buy the drink. Um, I can't, I can't thank you enough for, for being a part of this trip that I'm on. Well, as we wrap up, I just want to take a moment to acknowledge you for your lifelong pursuit of mastery as a drummer, as a musician. Uh, I want to thank you for putting out all-time great music that has become the soundtrack to many lives around the world, including my own. Uh, you know, people people associate certain moments in their lives and good times with the music that was out at that time. So, you know, with, with all of the singles you guys have, it's like I can pinpoint specific uh, ages that I've been specific moments, specific things that I've gone through. So I thank you for that. I want to um, thank you for taking the time to give back as a drum teacher, as a speaker, you're helping to inspire the next generation of, of, of musicians uh, to show them what's possible. If you dedicate your life to, to music, that you can have a career in the industry, you can have success. You've shown what is truly possible there uh, from a, uh, uh, a Canadian boy from Winnipeg, what he's been able to accomplish. And last but not least, I want to thank you for sitting down with me for the last two plus hours for this interview. Uh, I've been a fan for a long time. You've answered all these questions I've had for a very long time. So Mitch, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I, yeah. What can I say? Just like the fans, I can't thank you enough. Right. And, uh, and, and recommendations, talk to Ellen Reed. She'll talk your ear off. And and she'll you'll just be enlightened every moment of the way. Amazing that that's your uh, your suggestion for the next guest. I love it. So uh, so to the to the Mitch fans to the Crash Test Dummies fans. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you on the next episode. Bye. If you've enjoyed today's episode of the podcast, please take a moment to subscribe, like, comment, and share. What I want to know is who would you like me to sit down with next for a two-hour deep dive interview? You can let me know by reaching out to me on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok at Joel Martin Mastery. Joel is J-O-E-L. And you can find me on Twitter and Snapchat at Joel Mastery. So I am done. I am complete. I approve this message. And I'll see you on the next episode.